All right, Lead Heads, welcome back to the Talking Lead Podcast. And this is episode 223. That's right, 223. What's a, a perfect number for a gun podcast? 223. So we're coming off last week's episode, which was uh, an awesome episode where we had the guys and gal from Iraq Veteran 8888. We had Eric, Chad, and Brandy. And we had a great time on that. It was just a laid back, just kind of informal with just us sitting around, chit-chatting, shooting the shit, having a good time. Uh, Great time with those guys. So make sure you go back and check out that episode. And then we also continued our interviews from the Big Three East where we had um, Blackout Custom Cerakote. We had Tucker from that. It's his second time on the show. Uh, He was on last year. And uh, those guys have come a long way since last year with their Cerakoting business. Uh, They're actually into uh, slide cuts also with their Force One Tactical Company. And they're doing some awesome work over there. So make sure you guys check them out. Blackout Custom Cerakotes. Uh, And then we also had Steve from Medieval Industries. Uh, Steve, he's the uh, the owner, CEO. uh, And they have that, that cool foregrip that you can do like 360 degrees with. They've got like on a little ball joint. So it's a pretty cool thing. I got some hands-on with that while I was down there in Florida. Um, looking forward to uh, getting a little more with it. I think uh, we're going to try to get him to send me one of those, and uh, we're going to give it a good uh, shake. So before we get into this week's show, as always, we'd like to thank the sponsors of Talking Lead. Right on USA, the official optics of Talking Lead. That's right, guys. I am so proud to have these guys as one of our sponsors. Their scopes and red dots are some of the best optics that I have ever laid eyes on, pun intended. Uh, Their binoculars are phenomenal. You guys got to check those out. If you've not had an opportunity to go to their website, rightonusa.com, make sure you go there and uh, check out their full line of optics. Like I said, they've got binoculars, they've got rifle scopes, they've got red dots, they've got a magnifier, and they are working on spotting scopes as we speak. So hopefully those will be out any day now. Uh, But I've got their 5x25 they're Mod 7 on my Nordic Components 308, and uh, it is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, the clarity through these scopes is amazing. Uh, I had that thing dialed in. I was at 300 and, I don't know, 15, 20 yards the other day, and uh, the clarity of the target from you know fully magnified in at that 25 was still just crystal clear. So you guys make sure you go check them out, and when you do, I know you're going to want to buy something. And we've got you covered, so use that Talking Lead Leadhead discount code at checkout, and you're going to get a nice, hefty 20% discount from the guys at RideOnUSA.com. X Steel Targets. X Steel Targets. The best, most affordable AR500 steel targets on the market today, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. Check them out. XSteelTargets.com. Whether you're law enforcement, military, you're a competition shooter, precision shooter, hunter, whatever it may be, they've got a target just for you. And, oh, by the way, if you don't see anything on there that fits your build, then give Bud a call over at X-Steel Targets, and they will custom make targets just for you. So check them out at xsteeltargets.com. Modern Spartan Systems. Optimize your firearms with Modern Spartan Systems line of products. They have gun greases, gun oils, gun cleaners, anything and everything that you need to maintain your firearms, they've got it there at modernspartansystems.com. And they are having a a bit of a contest. I don't really want to call it a contest, but they're having a challenge right now with their product. So if you go to their website, you get all the details there. And uh, what they're doing is um, they want you to try their product, shoot your gun without it, get their product, put it through the recommended cycle. They tell you everything you need to do there to do this and send in your pictures, your testimonials. They're going to pick random people and give some awesome prizes. So go check them out at modernspartansystems.com. If you're interested in taking part in that challenge, you can get in touch with me at talkingled at gmail.com and I can get you that information as well. Frontier Tactical, the makers of the Warlock multi-caliber system. Check them out at frontiertactical.com. They've, uh, their Warlock system In a nutshell, what it does is it's compatible with just about any AR-15. 
uh, mil spec AR-15, and you're going to replace that uh, standard barrel nut with their Warlock barrel nut system, and then that's going to give you the ability to change your AR-15 out to shoot up to 90 different calibers. That's right, 90 different calibers from one AR-15 platform. So go check them out, FrontierTactical.com. And oh, by the way, if you're in the market for an AR-15 and this appeals to you, they make their own line of AR-15s, the FT series uh, that comes standard with the Warlock system on it. And they are extremely affordable. So go check them out at FrontierTactical.com and tell them you're a leadhead. Doesn't hurt. You might get a discount on one of those. High Threat Concealment and their line of retention products, holsters, mag carriers, belt systems. They've got a full line uh, full line of streamlined uh, concealed carry options for you lead heads. And uh, he's going to throw this discount code out. I think we threw it out last week when we uh, announced them as one of the official sponsors of Talking Lead. Uh, again, the code LEADHEAD, and you're going to get 15% off at highthreatconcealment.com. Go check them out. But this week, to uh, celebrate our monumental 223 show, I couldn't think of anybody better to have on than our good buddy Nick Atkinson with Beastmaster Hunting. What's up? <laughs> What's up, brother? Uh, nothing. Good to be back. I'm glad to have you back. I know uh, you've been uh, kind of touring around a little bit. Uh, you've got some good stories you're going to be bringing to us from Alaska. Yeah, man. Been busy, been traveling, been hunting, and uh, I feel like I've been back for two and a half weeks now, and I, I feel like I'm barely recovering. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were almost gone like a month. You were in Alaska for like almost a month. Yeah, 20, I think right at 20 days. 20 days, wow. So you were up there, you were hunting some brown bear, right? Right. Or yeah, big... brown bear, and um, technically we could have shot wolverines, uh, but you'd, I'd have had to use my brown bear tag if I'd have shot a wolverine, so I didn't want to do that. Um, oh wow wolverines i didn't know they were in alaska yeah yeah so brown bear wolverine wolf wolves and uh coyotes were on the menu okay now did you have tags for all those or were the other ones just uh shoot them as they come up yeah you don't have to in the unit that we were hunting and so all the units are different up there uh, as far as what regulations they have so in the unit we were in you did not have to have a tag for wolves uh and coyotes as far as i know um, statewide, but definitely the unit that we were in, you don't have to have tag for because they're actually not a native species there. So they're, they're considered invasive. Interesting. Okay. Yep. Well, very cool. So we're going to, we're going to talk to Nick about his, uh, big brown bear hunt up there in Alaska. Uh, but first I hear that jack wagon train rolling in. Gunny, bring it on in. Who uh, Semper Fi, do or die, hold them high at eighth and nine. It is time for the talking lead jack wagon of the week. So brace yourself, baby. All right, the train has stationed, and we've got some jack wagons to talk about this week. Uh, actually, we're going to take it a little different route, uh, but first I want to see, Nick, do you have any jack wagons that you want to throw on the jack wagon train before I get into mine? Oh, man, I, you know, we uh, we talked about doing this show the other day, and I had one in mind, but now I, I just, it left me. We started talking about uh, uh, all this other newsworthy stuff. And uh, I think mine was probably based around Walking Dead or something. So oh, I'll, leave, I'll, yeah. I'll, leave, <laughs> I'll leave it to you today. No, no, I remember that. So let's do that because uh, that, that, that was a good one. So we were talking about all the, um, uh, the gun faux pas that they've got in The Walking Dead. Yeah, we were gone for, uh, you know, a couple of weeks, three weeks, and uh, got back to watch all the... The Walking Dead, just as it started, I think we had two episodes recorded or something, and and then this last one, and it's like non. This season is nonstop automatic weapon gun fire. action. Yeah, I mean <laughs> this is big, they fired more cool. bullets, I think, in this than they they did in all the other seasons put together. Yeah, it would be cool if if it was done right, but uh, <laughs> yeah, man, so, it's it's bad this season. So I was I was watching it the other night, and it was so funny because after I watched it, I was sitting there, I was like. I can't believe that they were doing that. And we'll talk about what they're doing in a minute. And then uh, I got on uh, social media and I saw your post and I was like, I was just thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> I was like, yeah. it's hilarious. But I enjoy it because, uh, you know, I don't watch it for its accuracy, you know, as far as the, the firearms go. They, well, I, they've I, done this the whole, you know, their whole eight years, eight seasons, whatever it is. There's always something screwed up with their gun logic, you know. I don't 
you know, I don't necessarily watch it and think something to the effect of, man, these people don't know what they're doing because they not they don't know what they're doing. They're not supposed to know what they're doing, right? Right. And I, I think they tried really hard um, on this season to make it seem like they were all training and getting ready for this big battle. So it's really obvious that they're trying to be super tactical and they're just a bunch <laughs> right. of idiots. Wearing their and, airsoft gear. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Oh, and, and who thinks sheet metal stops bullets is what I want to know. <laughs> right. These, this, are these armored cars that they built. Oh, my gosh. Their, yeah, it's ridiculous. All so, it's but, doing is hindering their vision. <laughs> I guess... I guess if you had to narrow it down to one person or one group of people, I'm going to say the producers of The Walking Dead because it I mean ultimately they're the ones that decide how how it's going to go down and who who made the decision early on? I can remember the first few seasons were good, but then I I think it was like when they were at the prison till now. Yeah. Every gunfire, every scene with gunfire is CGI. There's a a CGI muzzle flash and you know just fake simulated recoil and no brass sometimes they don't even do the recoil well <laughs> which would be better right which would be better because when it is done the recoil it's like you're shooting a cannon or something you like know? like when they were shooting that uh, the shotgun the the barn scene when the little girl comes out of the barn you know and they've got yeah, the shotgun yeah, that was season two i think yeah, I mean, it was early on, and she's shooting yeah. the twelve gauge, and there's no, there's no recoil whatsoever on the but the twelve gauge. Uh, and the but now it's like, uh, I surely that CGI costs mo- more money than a bunch of blanks would. I don't know, but well, it's safer, I guess. I guess you know, maybe they're. <sighs> I guess it's I mean, safer than blanks. I don't know, but, but uh, so you know, so full- point out, so point out the the flaws in in their. Uh, so the the biggest thing with the last CGI. episode that that brought this on this rant, you know, that, that has started, um, was they've got these jalopies all up armored with, <laughs> sheet, with sheet metal, like right. tin roof metal, you know, like bullets and, go through those like butter. Right. But whenever they're taking fire, it's all just CGI sparks where the bullets, I guess are supposed to be bouncing off of these things. Right. And then the muzzle flash out of all the guns that you see people shooting is CGI muzzle flash. And then, when you, there's a a shot from the side of somebody that's shooting uh, an M16, which I, man, there's a lot of M16s in this show. There's some um, AKs and M16s, and uh, but they kind of explain that because Ruger they said that Mini? they got it. There was they, a Ruger they, Mini. They said that they got it from that security outpost, outpost or whatever. So yeah. okay, I can I can deal with that. That's that's good enough for me. But you've got a scene of somebody shooting, and it's angled from the side, and full auto just. <laughs> Right. And the bolt in that gun is sitting still. Not moving. <laughs> right. There's no bullets coming out. Right. And then like half the time they'll be pulling the gun down or picking the gun up. And that's when the, sh- you know, the shooting continues after they've already moved the muzzle down or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And there's no brass. That's what, that's what really, cause I was probably sitting there not even paying attention to the show. Just kind of like looking around on the internet on my phone and glanced up and noticed like five people, just a stream of full auto fire and no brass. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> dude, these guys would be like wading through brass for these last three episodes, you know? It, so that's it was just like, what it was like in post, they started watching the, the thing. They're like, you know what? There's no muzzle flash or, you know, anything like that. Let's get, uh, my 12 year old son here to CGI some of this in. <laughs> yeah. And it's not, oh man, it's just not good. And, and then I, I mean, towards the end of the last season, they, they're in, I don't know what, even what kind of building it is. I, it is almost like a radio station or something that they're in. Uh, it's concrete walls, all cinder block walls and hallways yeah. and stuff. Or it's, was it a, was it, was it a slaughterhouse? I don't remember. The prison? Uh, no, 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 no. This is the end of last season, not two seasons ago or three, however many oh, that was. Last but, season. but there's this one scene where uh, two or three of the good guys are trapped in a room. I can't remember if it was like uh, the armory or whatever, and they just start blasting through the door, full auto, like uh, all kinds. I don't even know what kind of machine guns they were. It's been so long since I've seen it. But you're, I'm just going, man. They would be so deaf, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Because they, Their ears they would all, be ringing. They dump like 400 rounds out of these machine guns uh, in a room that's like a 10 by 10 room with door closed, with a metal door and cinder block walls. So, I, I mean, yeah, I can suspend reality uh, to some extent and ignore stuff like that. 
but uh, just give me some <laughs> real gunfire, you know? At least give me some, well, first first some brass. It, yeah, I first, I first noticed it, um, I think, when Carl started shooting people. And I don't know if maybe they decided the kid doesn't need to be shooting, <laughs> like, real gun, <laughs> real blanks or whatever, because it's louder. I don't know. It's just, man, that, that pissed me know. off. I don't know why. It's like that show makes so much money. Just spend the money and make they've it. Got, yeah, they've got the money. They're, they've yeah. got the budget to you know to do the most uh, modern, <laughs> state of the art CGI stuff. But yeah, they're so obviously the uh, dead. pocketing a lot of that, so <laughs> they're not putting it I back guess. into the they're, show. They've they've jumped the shark. Have you ever heard that? Oh yeah, yeah. that had you, you know where yeah. that originated. That shark pot. Yeah. How could you accept the challenge? It wasn't me, it was you. I know, I know. It's okay. It's okay. He's really gonna do it. He's ready to make the jump. There he goes. Yeah, the Fonz, man. Happy days. Yeah, the Fonz. <laughs> <laughs> so they've definitely jumped the shark. I know some people have bailed out on the series, and I'm getting. It's only going to take like two more episodes that have been as bad as these oh, first. Oh no, three I'm in it, man. I'm I'm enjoying it. I'm, <gasps> I'm really enjoying it. Uh, again, I don't watch it for the you know the firearms accuracy. It's just you know just the storyline that I'm into. I don't either, I like but it. I want I want you know the characters. Like, Go watch Terminator 2. Tell me they CGI'd any of that gunfire. No. You know, <laughs> it's all well, it's all it's all real muzzle flashes, firing blanks and brass going everywhere, you know. And they've got that budget yeah. to do it. Well, they they obviously have the budget now. Yeah, but I think they're still in that men, you know, that mental budget of, you know, this is what we started with and this is what we got. You know, we made it work with this. Let's continue. I don't, but I don't remember that being so bad in the first well, several Well, they haven't seasons. they haven't had I guess other than when uh, the governor was there, I guess that was the biggest yeah. um, firefight that they had. But I don't recall ever seeing, like you said, I don't guess they did as, as many close-ups. I don't know. I don't well, know, but it's obvious in this one. <laughs> there just wasn't 30 people lined up with automatic weapons. They just, on that one, they went with, I mean, come on. That one, they, they blew stuff up because they had a tank. So, that, I mean, that was pretty cool. Yeah, and there was a lot of smoke, so it was probably hiding a lot of the stuff, too. So Yeah. A lot of the flaws. So, but, yeah, it could have... Uh, I'm could still so again. I'm just. I'm going to enjoy it for what it is. But yeah, definitely they could make it more realistic, without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's mine. The producers of The Walking Dead. So now that we're on TV, before I get to my jack wagon, have you watched? Um, it's called Mine Hunters. Have you heard of what, that one? What network is it on? I haven't heard it. Uh, Mine Hunters. I think it's a Netflix original. Uh, if it's on Netflix, I probably will get around to it. Netflix is like, I think I watch more Netflix than anything now. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's uh, just a high level. It's based on, and I don't know if it's like historically, you know, this is how the FBI came up with their, their profiling uh, policies and techniques, you know, as far as uh, yeah, uh, psychological backgrounds and profiling and stuff like that. But it it's kind of, you know, it's back in the, I guess it's the 50s, maybe, or 60s. And... uh I don't know. It's cool. You you'll like it. I think you'll like hmm. it. Interesting. Serial uh, like serial killers and stuff like that. So yeah, I like a lot of the Netflix. I, in fact, I think I like all of the Netflix original shows. Stranger Things. I do like Stranger Things. Have you it's started good. season two yet? <clears throat> um, I think we just finished episode eight. I'm not sure how many episodes there are this season. I'm not sure. I don't know. But yeah, it, I think I think I like this season better than the the first season. Let's see, uh, season two, how many episodes? It has nine episodes, so I'm one you away. Got one more for the for the finale. Yeah, I'm, and I wish that shows like that would do like in the old school TV 
era where it was just like 22 episodes, you know, <laughs> or right. what is that? The CW, the, the CW, CW. <laughs> they do like 30 episodes per season. Oh my gosh. The CW is like, you could watch one show on the CW and that's all their shows. They're, yeah, yeah. they're all the same drama and love triangles and it's bull crap. I'll tell you, HBO comes out with a good series too. And one of my favorites, uh, that is about to wrap up next week is Vice Principals. Have you watched that? No, Vice Principals. Nope. Oh man, I've seen that. Do you, uh, Danny McBride. Oh uh, God, I love that dude. Yeah, <laughs> so he such a and name. they wrote it. They it's only two seasons long, but they wrote it all before they started filming. So it's you know meant to be two seasons. Right. So it's uh it's pretty pretty hilarious. I'll have to get into that one once I finish up with a couple of these other ones. Definitely. Uh, but another one, Veep. Have you watched Veep? Um, I have. That's old though. Is it? Is I it mean, canceled? I just kind of started watching it. Uh, no, I a couple think it's still. Ago. Man, I can't remember if it's still on or not. That's hilarious. Uh, I love that show. But uh, yeah, it's. I've I've caught episodes here and there. I just never have sat down and actually watched it. And then um, of course Game of Thrones. I mean, you got to throw that one yeah. out there for HBO. That's huge. yeah. H- HBO has good stuff. Good series. Yeah, Netflix is kicking their ass though. Well, you know what's funny is I can't remember who I was uh, listening to on the radio or on a podcast or something the other day, and they were talking about how H- – oh, it was uh, on YouTube, Kevin Smith, the guy who does all the – No, I love uh, Kevin Smith, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He made and, uh, Clerks. And, yeah, and uh, he's got an awesome YouTube channel where Fat they just Man talk about – Fat Man on Batman. Exactly. They just talk about movie reviews and everything, yeah, but he was, talking about how, he was talking about how HBO um, was like, look, we made a movie, you know, whenever they like – come out with a movie like every two finals. years yeah yeah and, and netflix is like here's 19 <laughs> right <laughs> here's 19 movies here's 19 movies that are you know complete you can binge watch yeah, them so netflix is kicking everybody's ass yeah i i just listened to that um that episode i guess it was yesterday i listened to listen to his podcast when i work out yeah i love kevin smith he was in nashville he uh was at he was at the ryman um when i was god where was i was out of town so i couldn't go yeah, I was pissed off because I wanted to go. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to see him in person. Yeah, he's a funny dude. All right, so enough about TV. Um, let's get into my jack wagon because we got we got some bear hunting to talk about. Uh, so as everybody's well aware, uh, you know, we've had a lot of freaking media coverage on uh, mass shootings recently, uh, and there because there have been, you know, so and they they deserve the coverage and the attention, but. Um, this latest one was down in your neck of the woods, and when I say your neck mm-hmm. of the woods, Texas. Texas is huge. I don't know how how close was this uh, this church shooting to to where you are. Man, you know, I I heard the name of the town, and I and I I didn't recognize it. I, so I'm assuming it was southeast of here. But what uh, what give it to me again? Uh, I'm looking for the town. Uh, let's see. Starts with an Sutherland S. Springs. Yeah. So let me see where that is. Okay. So while you're go- googling that. So for you, you guys who haven't heard about this, uh, there was a, a guy who walks into a church, uh, and this happened, when was this? November the 5th, 2017. It was a mass shooting at the First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, Texas. It's about 30 miles east of the city of San Antonio. Yeah, so it's between, it's southeast of San Antonio, so kind of between, well, kind of between, right in between San Antonio and the coast, but uh, I've never been down there. So that's, uh, I don't know, that's 250 miles from me. Okay, which I mean, relative. That's that's not too. In far. Texas terms, that's not too far. <laughs> yeah, that's like neighbors. <laughs> it's like your closest neighbor. <laughs> but this dude, uh, he was a twenty-six-year-old uh, Devin Kelly or something like that. Uh, he shot. He killed twenty-six people and he injured another twenty. Uh, I think is what the numbers, the most accurate numbers are. Uh, he was shot twice by a local civilian as he exited the church. Then he fled in his vehicle. And then uh, these two dudes chased him. Uh, dude crashed, and then uh, I think he was found with a self-inflicted gunshot to the head, is what the the report is. So, um, but he was shot twice before he even got in the truck and fled. Uh, definitely, you know, I'm throwing this this Devin Kelly dude on the jack wagon train. He's gonna burn in hell, you know, for eternity, and then some. Um, but I'm taking this a different route. I am going to actually we're going to talk about heroes. You know, this this fuck this this Devin Patrick dude. These two guys that 
you know, went in harm's way to help protect their fellow man, their fellow citizens. Uh, I am giving kudos to these guys. You know, I want to talk about these guys. I don't want to talk about this, uh, this crazed individual, which again, I don't know what his motives were yet. I haven't heard, uh, but nothing justifies what he did. There's, I want to hear, I want to hear them tell the story, you know? Yeah. Those, uh, the two guys. So the two guys, um, that intervened were, I'm looking forward here. Stephen Williford, W-I-L-L-E-F-O-R-D. And he was the guy who shot him as he was coming out of the church. And then uh, this other guy was passing by in his truck, and he runs up to the guy. He's like, hey, we got to go get this this asshole. Um, and the other guy was Johnny Langendorf, I believe. He's a young fella. I don't know how old he was. So they get in a uh, dude's truck, and they haul ass after this guy. And they're doing like a 95-mile-an-hour uh, chase, you know, because they, they don't want him to get away. So they're basically just trying to keep eyes on this guy so that, you know, they've got 911 on the phone. We're like, hey, we're in pursuit of this guy. He's headed this way and this way. So they managed to, I guess, run him off the road or he loses control and, and runs off the road. Uh, and then supposedly they were holding him at gunpoint until the, you know, the police got there. And sometime between there and when, I guess, when the police got there, uh, he shot himself in the head, supposedly. So, uh, I'm, I mean, these guys are heroes. They, you know, without regard to themselves, they went into harm's way and they stopped evil. And that's what it takes to stop evil. That's the only way that you can stop evil is by a good guy and a good guy being equally or better armed than the evil guy. So kudos to these guys. They are heroes. I posted this on social media if you got any lead heads that are in that area, uh, if you know these guys, uh, get me their contact information somehow, some way. I'd love to get them on the show, uh, and I definitely want to send them some uh, Talking Lead uh, swag. So, um, TalkingLead at gmail.com. If you guys, uh, anybody out there knows these guys can get in touch with them. Would love to have them on the show and definitely want to uh, send them some cool Talking Lead stuff. So that's that's the way I wanted to go with the jack wagon train this week. Excellent. I'm tired of talking about all these these <clears throat> douchebag evil people. We got to get more heroes. We got to get more good people that can protect themselves, protect the ones that they love, instead of tucking tail, turning cheek, and trying to be passive about all this. You, you can't be passive. Have you noticed all these uh, these uh, mass shootings or uh, attempted mass shootings that happen in Texas? The guy ends up getting shot by somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the, the the media doesn't cover those. They don't talk about them. I'm trying to I, I I can think of two right off the top of my head. Obviously, this first the one we were talking about, but um, that one where uh, it was some uh, radical Islam guy I don't know showed up at some convention center up at, up around the Dallas area, and the cops shot him like as soon as he got out of his car. <laughs> it was like two years ago. <laughs> yeah, and that you know, and that's that's why we have to have a well armed society. And when I say well armed, you got to be trained in the use of your firearm. You can't just own a firearm. You got to know how to use your firearm, when to use your firearm. And uh, apparently, this guy was putting some shots on target on this guy uh, because he was wearing body armor. Oh, and, really? Yeah. I didn't, hear any, I didn't hear any details on this one. I've just I've been busy, hadn't watched the news, and hadn't even been on on uh, had time to read the articles I've seen on social media about it. Yeah, so uh, I'm reading from uh, Wikipedia, and Wikipedia's already got a full freaking you know page on this, and it's only been a few days, so uh, I don't know how accurate it is, but w Wikipedia, in my opinion, tends to be pretty just the facts kind of place to get information. <clears throat> I think it depends on who types it. Well, yeah, right, right. <laughs> but that's the thing is, it's kind of one of those. It's one of those self checking. Yeah, websites yeah. where if you got the wrong info, people are going to be blasting and saying, "Hey, that it, you know. right." Uh, but anyway, this dude, and I'm not going to say his name. He, he was uh, from New Bronzefels, Texas, about 35 miles from the Sutherland Springs. That's where Schlitterbahn is. Okay, and then he attended the uh, the New Bronzefels High School. Uh, one former high school classmate described him as an outcast, but not a loner who was popular among other outcasts. A close friend from middle school through high school recalled he wasn't always a psychopath, though. 
wasn't always a psychopath. <laughs> Gosh. And that, over the years, we all saw him change into something he wasn't. Well, obviously he was. <laughs> yeah. He changed into something maybe that he didn't used to be. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, after graduating, he enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. He served in logistics readiness. Oh, at, is it? Sorry, is this a guy he, that uh, – I did hear something about this. He's He was uh, – is this the guy that had felony convictions and they didn't report him to the FBI or something and that's how he bought the guns? Uh, I'm not sure. Let's see. I uh, did hear it. We were talking about that the other day. So that was in New Mexico from 2009 to 2014. He married. Uh, soon after, he was charged with assaulting his wife and fracturing his stepson's skull. So, yeah, I think that would probably exclude yeah, was... him from owning a firearm there. In response, Kelly made death threats against the his superior officers who charged him and he was caught sneaking firearms into the Air Force base. He was then admitted to a behavioral health services, a mental health facility. Again, another pattern we're seeing here, you know, mental you know, mental health issues here. Uh, Kelly escaped from the behavioral health services, but was soon apprehended 10 miles away. Uh, the facility's director, military, recalled Kelly stayed several weeks. So blah, 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 there's that. He divorced. Uh, he was convicted. Uh, by a general court martial on two counts for assault on his wife and stepson. He was sentenced to 12, 12 months in uh, confinement. He's ranked, dropped to the E1. He appealed but was unsuccessful, dismissed with a bad conduct discharge. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and something, there, I'm, I'm fairly certain this is it, but there was something like it was either misreported or not reported correctly. And so that was how he was able to still go buy a firearm. It says, so the ability to purchase and carry firearms. Kelly purchased four guns at stores in Colorado and in Texas between 2014 and 2017. On October 29th, a week before the shooting, he posted a photo of an AR pattern rifle. I don't know what an AR pattern rifle is on his Facebook profile. An AR pattern rifle was used in the attack. I mean, again, they want to make it. What, I don't know what he used. An AR pattern rifle. Uh, in the just attack, to, two like, handguns were found. AR pattern, back. AR pattern would just be an AR plat, like designed on the AR platform. I think it was probably just a semi-automatic rifle that he used, and I was thinking it was like a mini, a Ruger Mini 14, maybe. I, I'm not even. I don't even know. Let's see if it gets into that. Kelly purchased the semi-automatic rifle used in the shooting from an Academy Sports Outdoor store in San Antonio, April 2016. He filled out the required ATF and indicated that he did not have disqualifying criminal history. So he lied. An FBI National Instant Criminal Background Check is required at the time of purchase of all firearms. Uh, valid license to carry a handgun. State of Texas denied his application for a license to carry a handgun in public, although a license is not required to purchase firearms under Texas state law. Uh, federal law prohibits those convicted of domestic violence from possessing firearms. And Kelly's general court martial conventions for domestic violence should have been flagged in the NICS database and prevented a purchase. So that's what you're probably talking about there. Right. It says, however, the Air Force failed to relay the court martial convictions to the FBI, saying in a statement, initial information indicates that Kelly's domestic violence offense was not entered into the NICS <clears throat> National Crime Information Center database by the Air Force base of special investigations. One day after the shooting, the Air Force said it had launched a review on how the service handled the criminal records. Okay, so that's how that fell through the cracks. The Air Force did not um, report it to this database. Right. So again, that's that that's not a flaw in the background check system. That was a flaw in reporting information that's supposed to be reported to this National Crime Information Center database. So there's no law <laughs> that's going to uh, enhance or make the background checks that exist any better. It's just it's human error, and you're going to have human error in anything that you do. It's always going to be there. So that that answers your question. Yeah. So that's the the case that yeah. you're thinking about there. Yeah. It'll be it'll be interesting to see if this has occurred before. Obviously, not where it's occurred that they didn't report it, and then there's a mass shooting. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if they come up with other accounts uh, where they failed to report it correctly or didn't report right. it. You know, just to see what the percentage is. Yeah, I guarantee you, there's going to be a mass dump of uh, military service records into this system now. Right. It's probably going to get flooded. And it's going to cause um, 
technical problems probably with the system for a while, but they'll get it worked out. Uh, so there's all, apparently some hoaxes and conspiracy theories related to this as well. Let's see what it oh, says. Oh, man. <laughs> of course. Fake news websites and far-right activists published misleading stories and conspiracy th stories about the incident. They associated the shooter with a range of people and groups the far-right opposes, such as identifying the shooter as a Democrat or a rad radicalized Muslim, or claiming he carried an Antifa flag and told churchgoers this is a communist revolu revolution. Some reports falsely claimed he targeted the church because they were white conservatives. This misinformation mirrored similar events in the aftermath of the Las Vegas shooting a few weeks earlier, in which the perpetrator was falsely linked to leftist and Islamist groups. You know, I've not heard much about that Las Vegas shooting since it occurred either. Yeah, everything that I've... I've uh, of course, I was in... Uh... I was in Alaska while that was going down, but uh, every every time I see something about it, it's something like, "Oh, they're trying to cover it up. They're trying to cover it up," and that's it. That, you know, but it does seem like there's been very little information come out since then. Yeah, I mean, there there really has. Um, I mean, I've heard all kinds of conspiracy theories around that too. I mean, that, you're going to get that with any of this stuff. There's there's going to mm -hmm. be those people that come out left and right. You know, both sides of it, because everybody wants to be right. You know. <laughs> Well, it's like you can't even watch the news. Oh, and, I don't. And, I don't. But you, but to get information, because they all, they, they all want to be the first to report something. So what do they do? They report the first thing that they hear. You know, there's no. And then they make assumptions journalism. based on that. Yeah. Yeah, there's no investigative journalism or to find a credible source. It's just they hear something, so they report it. So it's like there's not even any point in watching it. That's where our laws need to be changed. <laughs> yeah. Is. There needs to be penalties and prosecutions for falsely reporting news mm -hmm. on all levels. So that that's where we need to come in and, and get more strict on our laws. All right, Gunny, uh, I think that's enough for today for the jack wagon train. Haul that sucker off, and uh, we're going to go try to track these two heroes down and buy them a beer. Need to. That was depressing. <laughs> Well, I mean, it was kind. Of, it was kind of good, and that one guy was um, a registered NRA. The um, what's his name? Not the Johnny, but Stephen. Still in Williford. <clears throat> so here's the story about there. I'm going to read this real quick. I may edit it in. I may edit it out. As Kelly okay. left the church, he was confronted by local resident and former NRA firearms instructor uh, Stephen Williford. Armed with an AR-15 pattern semi-automatic rifle, while taking cover behind a truck, Williford shot Kelly twice. After being shot, Kelly dropped his rifle and fled in his Ford Explorer as Williford fired several rounds through the vehicle's window. Williford flagged down a passing pickup truck driven by Johnny Langendorf, and they pursued Kelly at a high speed for about five to seven minutes. According to Langendorf, they drove at speeds up to 95 miles per hour. During the chase, Kelly called his father to tell him that he was injured and thought he would not survive. After losing control of his vehicle, Kelly's vehicle crashed into neighboring Guadalupe County near the city uh -huh. of New Berlin. He was observed to be motionless by the two men in pursuit, and police took over the scene when they arrived. Police found Kelly dead in his car with three gunshot wounds, including a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Two, uh, let's see, two handguns were found in the vehicle, a Glock 9mm and a Ruger 22 caliber, both of which Kelly had purchased. The Texas <clears throat> Rangers are leading the investigation, the FBI and the uh, BATFE, which is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, are assisting. Investigators said the shooting was not racially or religiously motivated, but rather a dispute with his mother-in-law. What? It's not religiously motivated, but he shot up a church. Okay. Well, his mother-in-law must have been in there. I guess. Seems like he would have just shot her then. <clears throat> it says inside, when he went in the church, it said he yelled, Everybody dies, motherfuckers, as he proceeded up and down the aisles and shot at people in the pews. See, police would later find, find 15 empty AR magazines capable of holding 30 rounds each. According to police, the shooting was... What? So what it says, captured on a camera set up at the back of the church to record regular services. So they got this whole thing on video. Wait, so hes they're saying he shot 450 rounds inside this church? They said that he had 15 
empty AR magazines capable of holding 30 rounds each. Now, whether he had They found him in the church. Is that what you said? They found him in the church? Said, no, it said police would later find. Doesn't say where they found him. Oh, okay. Police would, but that's, that's, you know, the, how media works. They don't let you know. Yeah, well, they're probably in his truck. Or they might have been in his house and he didn't take them. You know, they were empty sitting, sitting in his house. Um, Yeah. But it doesn't say where. It says later. It said police would later find. So that could have been in his house. It could have been anywhere. Yeah. But they yeah, want see, you to think that. Yeah, that he shot off 450 shot 400, rounds in this church. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's bullshit. Yeah. I mean, if he if he had shot that many, he had that much time to dump the mags, reload. Everybody in that church would be dead. There wouldn't be anybody. No, Marty. That gun will fire six to 800 rounds per minute. <laughs> With Don't the, you know that? That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> with with its uh magazine clip round uh, high capacity clip. ghost gun high capacity clip mags yeah. <laughs> fuckers all right enough about this get this jack wagon out of here i want to talk bear hunting with my buddy Bears. nick hey guys welcome back to beastmaster hunting i'm your host nick atkinson this is typically where you'd hear me say something like we're headed back to west texas or we're out in west texas or we're here in central texas but this uh month is a little bit different we are in Alaska on a brown bear hunt. Weather's awesome today. We're ready to get out there. We're going to hang out for a few days at Tillark Creek Lodge with Bushwhack Alaska hunting. And we're going to head back on these mountains back behind us and hunt some bears. So stick around. It's going to be awesome. Bears. Bears. Bear, bear, you- bears. I'm dying to go on a bear hunt. I keep getting fun. teased. I had um, I had Charlie Melton on the show uh couple episodes back and and for you guys who haven't listened to that episode charlie melton uh, is former navy seal he trained chris kyle and marcus luttrell among uh, other navy seal snipers Uh, he just made the world's longest we'll call it rifle shot you know how far oh yeah i saw that it was like three miles wasn't it it was was like 2.86 yeah 2.86 miles 5,025 yards i think is what it was so and he's using a 408, a custom 408 Tejas. But uh, he was going on a bear hunt, uh, I guess that next week, and he invited me to go, but due to um, scheduling conflicts, I couldn't go. So I was, they were going to, I think, Minden, Nevada is where they were going bear hunting. So I missed out on that one. Um, Should have gone. Well, I couldn't. <laughs> I wanted to. <laughs> I really did. Uh, but I've been promised on uh, to go on one next year. So I've got one hopefully lined up for next year. Nice. Um, but uh, I want to I want to hear about yours. So you went to Alaska. Yeah, we flew in. Uh, I think we left on the first or second of October from the house and flew into uh, Seattle. Then flew from Seattle to Anchorage. Then Anchorage to Iliamna, and then oh, that's where the yeah it was a lot of travel. It's like you're going uh, to Europe or something. Yeah, well, I mean it was the same length flight basically. Holy cow! Uh, you know, by the time you do all that, it's, uh, you know, we were in the air for like eight hours. So eight hours, you can go from like Chicago to London or something, you know? <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was a good time. I mean, it's, uh, so a little background a of, world. for you lead heads. Um, <laughs> Nick's been on the show before and, uh, Nick and I went on a hunt. Was it February? Yeah. Cause it was, uh, right after Valentine's day, I think. Yeah. So back in February, uh, got to go up and visit Nick in Texas and uh, we did some hog hunting and some coyote hunting and coons and whatever else. It was a bobcat, I think. You got a bobcat on that one, too? Yeah, we did. So I uh, had a great time, got the fever, uh, and obviously Nick knows what he's doing. The Beastmaster Hunting Channel, you guys, if you've not heard of it, go check it out. YouTube channel um, that Nick started up, well, I guess this year, didn't you? Is it, uh, you just started it up? Um, yeah, yeah, because we just, uh, just started... The idea for Beastmaster, like uh, in January, and Beastmaster Hunting LLC uh, in February, and along with all that, just YouTube and Facebook and everything. Yeah. So Nick and I, I guess we met through the Three Gun, is how we originally met. Nick is a uh, one of the top three gunners uh, in the nation, and uh, we met through, I guess, through our sponsor Cobalt Kinetics uh, at the time was sponsoring yep. us. And uh, I guess you are you still a shooter for Cobalt Kinetics? Nope, the Cobalt Kinetic shooting team does no does, does not, not exist any longer. Okay, does Cobalt Kinetics exist anymore? <laughs> yeah, as far as I know, you know that's kind of the trend with shooting teams is um, a company either gets a new marketing guy or is a fresh startup and they're like, we want to do something awesome, make a splash, so let's 
you know, start a shooting team and they do and they hire, you know, the top guys in the game to represent their product. And if it's a good product, then obviously you want to go be a part of that. And then either they get a new marketing guy a couple years later or marketing guys in the firearms industry seem like they move around quite a bit. And then with that goes their ideas and then somebody else new comes in and wants to start all over. Um, so, but that's just kind of the trend in shooting yeah. teams. It's kind of, they come and go. So you just kind of got to, got to go with the flow and, um, it kind of looks bad from the outside looking in, I'm sure, because it looks like guys are jumping around all over the place and representing different products. Just right. But it's not their fault. <laughs> well, that's right. You know, and to some extent you want to stick with and use the product that you feel is the best. But when somebody can create, when there's so many companies making so many good products and you're trying to do it for a living, then there's not really a reason not to Jump move around. on. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, and, and, you know, and it's not that you're jumping around. It's that, that, that opportunity ends and you just got to move on and Create either another one for it. yourself. Yeah. Right. So anyway, that's kind of the route that, uh, that cobalt went, but yeah, I mean, along the way you make all kind of good connections and, uh, you end up with new opportunities because of that. Yeah. So what are your new, have you come up with some new opportunities yet? Man, I'm just doing Beastmaster. Okay, well, that's your and you started this before all this, you know, with Cobalt. I mean, you you'd already right. had this planned out, and you know, this is something that you were going to do. And you're an avid hunter anyway, so right. uh, it just yeah. made sense that uh, you would do something like this. I still do have um, a handful of sponsors that I've had for several years, um, like Warren Scope Mounts, still with them. Oh, awesome! With I love those guys. Several years, yeah. Um, Proof Research and and Timney Triggers and a lot of these. Um, sponsors are sponsors that I've had for a couple of years, but because of what I'm doing with Beastmaster, it gives me the opportunity to work with them also. So that kind of helps, you know, that, that relationship is already there and I can go to them and say, here's what I want to do. And then they can help me develop a product. So, um, but yeah, everything for 2018 is going to be Beastmaster hunting focused, uh, nice. centric. Centric. But, uh, yeah, so it, uh, I, I don't even know how much three gun I'm going to shoot next year. Probably not a lot because I'm focusing more on the hunting side of the industry, uh, and just trying to grow that brand and, yeah. you know, turn that into a living. Well, I think you're on the right track with it. Definitely. Uh, are you on what your third episode of Beastmaster hunting? No, Alaska, I edited it, edited it the other day and uh, it's episode six. Six. So, okay. Yeah. We, you and I did episode one and two and, uh, we're on episode, I'm going to release that this month probably. So that's episode six, okay. but I, I saw yeah. one, two, three, I think I was, maybe I saw four, but I didn't know I got, I got some binge watching to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, but I can't wait five, to see the, the, the Alaska, you know, and it's, it's different because it's, uh, everything that we do here in Texas, we try to do in the dark with thermals and night vision, thermals and night vision are illegal in Alaska to hunt with. Um, so it, it's something that's completely different and it's a little bit different pace, but really I just wanted to show people kind of what hunting in Alaska is like. And a lot of people have never seen the terrain. My wife went with us and oh, cool. she was like blown away just by, you know, you look out the window of the airplane and it's just millions, hundreds of millions of acres of nothing. Just the know? majesticness of it too. Just untouched. Nobody's, you know, you, there's the potential that you're walking somewhere where nobody's ever been before, you know? Right. So that's cool. it's, uh, it's really cool. So how did but, this come uh, about? How did your bear hunt come about? Talk about how uh, the opportunity so a, came up. Yeah. I have a business partner, uh, in Beastmaster hunting and, uh, he suggested that we go on a bear hunt, and uh, so I just sourced one through through a booking agent, and we hooked up with these guys, did a little bit of research, and looked at you know uh, their website and how long they've been going. And the outfit that we went with is called Bushwhack Alaska. Bushwhack, Bushwhack Alaska, yeah, BushwhackAlaska.com, uh, I think is what it is. But hmm. um, you know they've been around for like 15 years or something, and it's crazy because the guys like my age. Yeah, and, you sent me that that pre video, and I was checking him out. I was like, this guy says he's been around for like doing this for twenty years. Is he? <laughs> you know, looks like he's like twenty five. My name's Eric Salatan. I've been guiding for nineteen years. Uh, I've been a registered guide here in Alaska since two thousand and eight. I live here in rural Alaska with my wife Martha May. Uh, we own two lodges here: the Tulare Creek Lodge here on the Alaska Peninsula, and uh, we own an additional lodge up in the Brooks Range in the Arctic of Alaska. Here at the Tulare Creek Lodge, we do uh, brown bear hunting, and we also do sport fishing in the summer. Up in the Brooks Range, we do dull sheep, moose, caribou, grizzly bear, and black bear as well up there. Uh, we're very blessed. We have a great life. We get to meet people from all over the world and share Alaska with them. And I love to talk hunting, so you call me anytime, 907-388-8766 or bushwhackalaska.com. 
or TalericCreeklodge.com. Well, that, that and it seems to be a common theme up there. Everybody that uh, I met that was a guide is really young, and the re- and I found out why. You spend a lot of time with these guys because, you know, we're we're in a spike camp for eleven days, and really, literally, all you have to do is sit there with binoculars looking for bears and and talking. You know, <laughs> right. that's it. There's no TV. There's no cell phone. There's nothing. It turns out to be a registered guide in Alaska, or a certified guide. I, I don't want to misspeak, but whatever it is to get a, your guide license. Yeah. You have to do an apprenticeship with uh, an outfitter or another guide or whatever, um, and usually you're required to do that for two years. And what they do is they put you in a position called a packer. We didn't have a packer on this hunt, but that uh, sounds painful. Yeah, so <laughs> packer. as a, if you're a packer, you get all of the gear, the ter- yeah, all the crappy duties basically. Um, but then your primary job is to pack the animal out. Um, whenever somebody kills one. So if you hike into the mountains, you know, seven or eight miles and shoot a moose that weighs, I don't know, like 1500 pounds or 2000 pounds, then you're packing a thousand pounds of meat plus a cape and antlers out, you know, and (laughs) to pack a moose out, my guide, uh, Wes told me that he's taken over a week to pack a single moose out before because you have to make so many trips. Holy crap. So it's really hard on you as far as your joints and your back and everything like that, because you're carrying 150 pounds potentially at a time. Right. And then you're doing that for seven days in a row. Sounds you know, like a so. racket to me to get your license. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, uh, the, the packers, as far as I understood, don't make any money. They just get tips, you know, from the hunters. So that's kind of like and, a dude on a deep sea boat, the guy who cuts the right. bait and the, the fish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Except for he's not wearing a 150 pound pack. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. So anyway, you have to be a packer. And most of those guys um, start when they're like 14, 15, 16 years old. And they, they're, they do packing for two or three years and then they take their test to be a guide. And then from then they do guide services and then, you know, some of them start their own outfitter and then the outfitter manages other guides. It's, it's something that you're, if you're going to do it, you start it early, you know? Yeah. That makes sense. Or I don't think I'd be able to do it at 34 years old. <laughs> or the reason there's so many young ones is you were telling me that Alaska has the highest rate of uh, plane crashes. <laughs> yeah. Cause everybody there is a pilot. So They're probably it's all like, dying when they, uh, it's like sad. driving a car there. It's, um, the, the little town that we were, uh, based out of Iliamna, there, there's no roads there. There's no roads to get there. You have to get there by plane or by ship. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So, and getting a ship in there would be really tough because you'd have to come in from the ocean, go up a river and then cut across the lake. Uh, there's Lake Iliamna, which is the biggest freshwater lake that is within a state of the United States. So it's a huge lake. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's pretty intense. Uh, you get in those little planes. Everybody flies those little Super Cub planes that are like, well, I looked it up earlier, 800-pound plane that right. holds two people. <laughs> and, and your gear. Uh, yeah, and your, and your gear. And uh, it's pretty intense. If it's if the wind's blowing at all, that thing is bouncing all over the place like a pinball. Oh, my gosh. So tell us about uh, you get there. You, you were telling me that before we started this, the, the plane hopping to get there. So you finally get there. Yep. Um, what, uh, what was it like from there? So, uh, you take an air taxi from Anchorage to Iliamna and then the, the outfitter picked us up there, takes us back to their lodge and they've got a, a lodge set up like you would imagine, you know, just a big common room, a big dining room, and then, um, like 10 bunk rooms that, uh, where you stay while you're waiting for your guide to either be done with his previous hunt or waiting for him to get there to take you out. Um, because you have to go out with a guide when you're brown bear hunting in Alaska. It's mm-hmm. required, unless you're a resident. Um, so we got there. The season for brown bears is October 1st to October 21st, I think. Okay. 20th or 21st. And uh, he already had the first – you booked 10 days at a time. So he already had the first 10 days of the season booked. I think he had six guides or seven guides. And uh, so we booked the second half of the season. But he said, you know, show up as early as you can because – uh, you know, if we have somebody kill a bear, then that guide will be available and he'll bring his hunter in and then take you guys out, you know? So we got there on like the third, uh, and our first day of hunting one's supposed to be the 10th until the 10th or 11th. Um, and it, uh, there was a bunch of lows coming in off the ocean and it was just bad weather. Uh, and nobody killed a bear early. So, well, actually one of the guys did kill a bear early, 
but check this out. They were in, they were up on a, like a, like a cliff side and the bush pilot, Luke, that, uh, runs everybody in and out, um, tried to get them like six or seven days in a row and couldn't get to them because the weather was so bad. Oh my gosh. So, so these guys were stranded in a tent on top of a mountain for seven days after they'd already killed a bear. So, oh my gosh. <clears throat> um, as it turns out, we had a break in the weather. Um, the first day we were supposed to go out. So we did get to go out, uh, on like the 10th or 11th. And then from there you stay in what's called a spike camp. And at spike camp, it's just a couple of tents, um, some food supplies, and that's it. And we were right on the, right on the beach. Um, so we had the ocean on one side of us and a big valley and mountains on the other side and a nice stream coming down. So you nice. get all your water out of the stream and just have enough food to, uh, we probably had 20 days worth of food. And of course, if you had to, you could kill stuff and eat it. But, uh, um, yeah, yeah. You know, if, if we're talking to like survival situation. But, so if, uh, if you want to go on a hunt in Alaska, you don't <clears throat> need to plan on, you know, I'm going to go up for a couple of days, do some hunting and come back. You're, you got to spend a few weeks there. Yeah. I mean, even if you're just, even if we said, no, we're just going to get there on the 10th, plan on going out on the 11th. Um, there's the potential that when you, when you kill an animal or the last day of the season rolls around, you could be stuck for another week, depending on the weather. You know, yeah, to get like out. What, like, yeah, like what happened with those other guys. Yeah. So, I mean, and this is not, I'm not, I'm not talking about like we were snowed in. I'm talking about like it was 70 mile an hour wind and rain. You know, uh, they, wow. they joke around up there whenever they're talking about high wind. It's hurricane force wind if you're in the lower 48. <laughs> um, right. Like, no joke. The, the day that we got there, there was 65 mile an hour wind. Um, oh my God. That night. So, I mean, it is, it, it's, it's pretty scary. Yeah. And then uh, for an 800 pound plane, that's. <laughs> yeah. They don't go out in that. Uh-uh, obviously. They're like, no, uh, thanks. If it's about 30 mile an hour, they'll, they'll attempt it. But even at 30, it's, it's like that plane takes off in like a hundred feet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It just goes, goes up in the air. Uh, the they big problem is the weather changes. Landings. Yeah. The weather changes so fast up there, um, that, you know, you get stuck out there. There was one, um, the first week we were there, we were in the lodge and, um, Eric, the guy who owns Bushwhack Alaska was like, well, let's go out on the boat and we'll just go look for some bears along the, the shoreline. So we were like, okay, you know, just get out of the, get out of the lodge. Cause we've been we'll sitting there crazy. Some, yeah. Yeah. And the weather, we kind of had a break in the weather, but it was still a little bit windy and we get about halfway across the lake and he turns around and I'm like, what are we doing? And he said, we're going back. And I was like, why? And he said, Cause the weather's coming in and if we go over there, we're going to get stranded. Like, because it would be so, the, the water would be so choppy that it would, you know, you couldn't cross it. Yeah. Um, because this lake is so huge. It's like an ocean, you know, and we're not in a boat that's made for the ocean. We're in a boat that's made to go up little creeks and stuff so we can look for bears. Yeah. And, uh, we got back to the house and sure enough, that was like those three days, um, you know, three days later, he was like, you know, if we'd have gone across the lake over there, we would still be over there. <laughs> be There'd be life. no coming back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'd be sitting over there sleeping in a boat and eating berries, you know, or that would whatever. Suck. Now, Hopefully shoot a bear. <laughs> now, did you do some fishing while you were waiting? Were you able um, to do any fishing? No, we could have. Um, but it was just kind of one of those things where the weather was, it was pretty it's tough. So choppy. So, yeah. Yeah. But uh, there were a couple times where they were like, hey, you want to go out in the boat and fish? And we were like... Nah, we want to sit here and see if there's a break in the weather so we can go hunting, you know? We'll pass. We're going to eat and drink. Well, yeah. It, uh, it's definitely different. There's, uh, you know, there's city time and then there's Alaska time, it seems like. You know, city time is like, um, you tell me to be on Skype at 645, I'm on Skype at 645. If I'm not, I'm texting you why I'm not on Skype at 645. Right. And then Alaska time is like... Yeah, we're gonna drop you off, and then we're gonna try to pick you up on Wednesday. But if they're not, we're not there on Wednesday, then maybe Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, we got so, some laundry to do between now and then. And, yeah, eat when you're hungry, and do work when there's work to be done. I guess is the mentality up there. Right. Uh, it's a different, different world. So you yeah. guys were it was a, a full week at least, right, before you're actually able to go out and hunt. Yeah, yeah, we were in the lodge for seven days and going going kind of stir crazy. And, Went out and rode around a little bit in the mountains just to look at stuff, you know, where the where the road ends, basically, uh, going out of town. And so while you're waiting that that week, what uh, what you guys did? You <laughs> sight your guns in? Did you do some shooting at all? Or yeah, I mean, we checked uh, we checked zeros on the guns just to make sure that they were good. Of course, you don't take just a ton of ammo. Um, 
because we didn't know, first of all, we didn't know we were going to be stuck for a week. Yeah. Uh, And you want to keep your weight down, I'm sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I had like two boxes of ammo, so you don't want to just shoot a ton. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just, just run around, kind of go look at, uh, the, the general store, you know, go back to the general store, (laughs) go look at the other general store, (laughs) do a bunch of selfies. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I shot a grouse while we were waiting. Oh, Um, cool. A grouse is like a, a ground bird up there. It's like a, a really big quail. What'd you shoot it with? Uh, so I, I didn't know this, but you can shoot uh, grouse up there with centerfire rifles. Um, oh, okay. And uh, I guess it's pretty common to shoot them with a twenty two. Uh, but we were we actually went out to check the zero on uh, this 300 Win Mag that I had taken. <laughs> and we're coming back, and there's a grouse. And the laws for shooting up there are as long as you're not on the road, you can shoot. Uh, okay. So we were within an area that we were allowed to hunt and a grouse runs across the road. I said, Hey, is that a grouse? And Eric's like, yeah. So he's like, we should shoot it and take it and eat it. I'm like, I have this 300 wind mag. (laughs) It's like, can you hit it in the head? And I'm like, probably. So I get out and fall it off in the woods and he pops out from under a tree and I smoke him right in the head. Right in the head. There you go. (laughs) It was from like seven yards. From other, otherwise you wouldn't have anything to eat. (laughs) <laughs> so uh we did that so and, y'all had uh, grouse one night <laughs> yeah yeah uh but yeah i mean the food is awesome up there uh because all they eat is uh wild game pretty much and and you can just i didn't know this but you can just walk outside you know off the beaten path and there's berries everywhere there's cranberries and blueberries and all kinds of stuff and you're just walking on them because they all grow on the tundra you know, nice. and it's like you're not even really walking on the ground. You're walking on vegetation. It's like it's so thick. Feel yeah, it feels like you're walking on a mattress. It's weird. <laughs> That's um, cool. But yeah, we had a lot of moose and a lot of caribou. So y'all had uh, time to like pick the berries and make your own preserves, and while you're waiting, <laughs> well, you know, do- <laughs> we're actually we were actually there right at the end of the time when the when the berries were uh, prevalent, but there were still some out. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it was right when everything's kind of getting cold. It was like 40 degrees, uh, kind of highs in the day whenever we got there. And then by the time we left, I think one of the days was in, it was like 15 degrees. So it was right, right at that change of the season. That's, uh, part of the reason why we didn't see as many bears as, uh, we would have normally seen yeah. is because it got so cold so fast that, uh, or early in the year that they, they were saying a lot of the bears were probably already underground hibernating. Yeah. So let's uh let's fast forward to where you you actually get to go out and you're you're on the hunt. Talk talk us through that. So uh we get out to Spike Camp and like I said, ours was on the beach. Um and get all set up, meet Wes, who is my guide. Um so it's like a one on one guide. You know, he's basically there just to help me get a bear. Yeah. Um and day one, uh, that we could, hunt. well, okay. So in Alaska, you can't fly in an airplane and then hunt the same day. It's illegal. Um, uh, is that, uh, for like spotting reasons or something? Yeah. And you can't have any communication with somebody, you know, about where animals are that they saw from an airplane or anything like that. And everything, they're really strict on everything. Um, game wise, you know, yeah. but, uh, so we fly into spike camp, get all set up and, kind of mill around camp and you can, you can glass and everything like that. So we sat around what, you know, looking at the hills with binoculars, uh, that first day. Um, second day we woke up and it was pouring down rain and like 45 degrees. So we spent all that day in rain gear, hiking up the valley and you couldn't really do much with binoculars. So it was kind of like if you saw something walk out within three or 400 yards, then that was about your only chance. Hmm. Um, the next, I'd say two days was better weather, but still a little bit rainy. Uh, we saw some bears, uh, but we saw a lot of sow and cubs, lots of females with babies. Um, so what's which, the, the rules on shooting? They got to be a certain, uh, sex, certain size. What? Uh, so you can't shoot a sow when she has cubs. Okay. okay. And you can't shoot cubs and, uh, with boars, there's no restrictions, uh, as long as they're not a cub. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So basically you can't shoot mama or babies. So what's, um, what's the distinguishing a characteristic of a cub versus a. Yeah. So a, a cub will always be with mama. Okay. Uh, if, if you see a bear by itself, you know, unless it's obviously like a little bitty, a bear. Little bitty bear running around going, bah, bah, looking right. for its mama, you know, you don't want to shoot that one. But, uh, if it's uh, typically a three and a half or four year old bear will be on on its own, then that's fair game. 
um, unless it's got its own babies. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious whenever you get out there and you see a, a, a thousand pound bear, uh, it's easy to d- distinguish that from a 200 pound bear. Sure. You know, um, so basically so, yeah. when in doubt, don't shoot. Yeah. I mean, like if you see a really big bear come out and it's a boar, shoot it. You know, if that's the bear you're looking for, yeah. uh, if you see a really big bear come out and it's a sow, then you're supposed to wait to see if any cubs are falling it out of the brush. Uh, the rule, is, the I, I think uh, they told me the way the law is written is you can't shoot a sow that's accompanied by cubs. Okay. So, which, you know, I'm sure there's mistakes that happen because a sow comes out of the brush and you sit there and watch it for two hours mm-hmm. and, and then you shoot it. And then all of a sudden here comes a cub, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, like, that's oh, going to happen. And when that does happen, you're supposed to turn it in uh, and basically explain the circumstances and whatever happens, happens. Right. Uh, sure as far as get, fine or something. Yeah. There's a ticket. They'll pull the guy's license and suspend it and everything like that. So it's, uh, it's pretty serious, but uh, yeah. So we saw a lot of sound cubs, um, saw a, a pretty cool wolf a couple times. Um, the first day we were talking about Wolverine We the first day when I landed, I got out of the plane and we're walking up to spike camp, carrying all our stuff and look over and there's Wolverine that swam across the Creek. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, huh, well there, you know, maybe he'll still be here in 10 days if I hadn't shot a bear. <laughs> just, um, just keep him in mind. Right. <laughs> right. The problem is all the animals up there cover so much ground. It's like you may see a bear in one spot one day and that bear could be 200 miles away the next day. Holy shit. Yeah. You know, yeah. They, they cover so much ground. They're just machines. Just looking for food. Uh, right. Yeah. Just running around eating, looking for a spot to den up, uh, and this time of year. But, uh, yeah. So the first three days were kind of rainy. And then the next, I'd say, um, three or four days was awesome weather, like sunny, kind of windy at times, but there were a couple days with just no wind. Um, and we're, you know, just doing everything we can to get on a good bear. What was the temperature? Um, when it was clear, it would get colder, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, probably in the 30s. Okay. And then towards the end, it got down in the 20s and teens. But mm. uh, it wasn't bad. I had a lot of really good gear. That was a a big part of going up there. Was, um, I did a lot of research because I knew I was going so far in advance and ended up with some awesome gear. Uh, most of it's Kuyu stuff, just ultra light hunting gear that you know you're not even thinking about you're wearing so much stuff but you're not thinking about it because it's not heavy and it performed great kept me dry um we'll talk about your gear uh after after we talk about the hunt on uh like day six uh maybe the six or seven i can't remember man everything all the days run together oh i'm sure once you're out there that long i mean seeing everything that you're seeing it just kind of all runs together but you did some videos right so our you know yeah our listeners, yeah. uh, uh, when that becomes available, we'll post it that way. Everybody can go check out the video of this. Yeah, I'll probably upload it um, this week. It'll be episode six, Beastmaster Hunting. If you go to YouTube and search Beastmaster Hunting, Nick Atkinson, uh, then you'll be able to find the channel. Okay. Well, and, it'll be uh, out. It'll be out before I post this show. I'm not going to post the show till okay. Monday, so I'll put a link in the show notes for. Yeah, everybody. perfect. But uh, yeah, so like day six or seven, maybe even five, we saw this humongous bear up on the side of the mountain and the, the the shitty part about this was it was two hours before dark oh. <laughs> okay <laughs> okay so we're down on the beach we've been watching the beach for the last like three hours wes spotted a big blonde bear up on top of the hill so we're gonna haul ass because we only have like two hours of daylight and try and get within a couple hundred yards of him and get a shot on him it's a big bear So we just came up 900 feet in elevation over two hours through the worst terrain I've ever hiked. It's probably the most dangerous thing I've ever done in my life. Wes does it on a daily basis. Um, and the bear was gone. So, I mean, there's nothing left to say. <laughs> that was disappointing. Now we gotta go back down in the dark. About a mile. If we walk, or if we flew in a straight line to base camp, it's a mile. Spike camp. So we're down. We're literally on the beach, 
and we're looking, we're watching the beach this last two hours a lot, hoping that a bear will just come wandering down the beach, you know, because they come down to the beach to feed. Um, and Wes looks up on the mountain with his binoculars and he's like, there is a humongous bear. And I was like, where I get my gun and load it. And he's like on the top of that mountain. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Oh man. And I said, how long before dark? And he's like two hours. And I said, how long will it take us to get there? He's like two hours. And I was like, let's go. Wow. So, you needed that 408 Tejas. Oh dude. <laughs> so that's uh, part of bear hunting too is, um, they don't really want you taking really long shots on the bears because the brush there is so tall. Um, because they don't get a lot of like lightning strikes and stuff. So there's nothing that kills, there's no fire that burns it off or anything. Mm. So the grass is like six and seven feet tall in some places. Oh, wow. Uh, and then there's these things called alder bushes that are just like the gnarliest, like woven together branches and they're almost impenetrable. Just like you got to crawl through some of it. Yeah. And they're like eight feet tall, nine feet tall. Dang. Um, so when you if you shoot a bear, they could very easily just fall over dead and you would never find it. Yeah. You know, because because get everything that, is so tall. Get in that mess, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could spend days and days and days looking for it and not find it. Um but uh so we we're making our way up this mountain, ch- stopping and the bear is still and it was a perfect he was in a perfect spot. He was like on the cliff side right below the top of the mountain. And he's just pawing around, like digging up roots and eating. And you got video of this? <clears throat> uh, yeah, with very little video, but just because it was so close to dark. Oh, okay. Uh, and we were like, let's just go. We don't have time to video this, you know. Uh, and it was actually so dangerous going up that we couldn't video it. Yeah. Uh, because for the most part, we were hacking through this real tall stuff, but then we get on this uh, like side hill of this valley, and you can see it in the video. Uh, my, my wife was taking the video. She pans around and you can see back down to the beach where we came from. And most of it was just side hill that we're walking on. And it's like, if you fall off of this, you're going to fall like 600 feet. <laughs> yeah. Got, got to pay <laughs> attention know? to what you're doing. Put the camera. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's not going to be like fall and just like skydive and smack on the ground. It's going to be falling and tumble. <laughs> Bouncing. Like 600 and... <laughs> yeah. Hit rocks and alders and all kinds of stuff. So we side hill and then finally, um, we get to this cliff side where we can't go any further. So it, I lay my pack down and, or actually Wes put his pack down. I put my rifle across it and he ranges the bear and he's four Oh one. And I was like, man, I can hit this You're bear. Like, That's my wheelhouse, baby. Yeah. You well, and, and you know, he knew I was a professional shooter and everything like that. And, um, I was like, I can, I can put it, you know, I can double lung shot this bear. No doubt in my mind, because it was right at sunset. So the wind had laid down and I've got dope on this rifle to 800, you know, and it's a oh, 300 yeah. wind bag. And I'm like, dude, I can smoke this bear. And he was like, <laughs> he, and we had talked about it before. When you shoot bears, you don't shoot them in the head um, because the skull is part of the trophy. But also it's thick. If you, yeah, well, no, I mean, you can, you, it'll, you can kill them. Yeah. It'll, it'll, it'll shatter their skull is the problem. Um, and it makes it ineligible to measure for Boone and Crockett. So Boone and Crockett is like the record. I got you. The record books for measuring bears. Yeah. Or or animals. Wild animals, game. yeah, deer, everything, yeah. <clears throat> right. So you don't want to shoot a gigantic bear in the skull because if it's some kind of world record, well now you it's ineligible, right? Gotcha. So, um, but whenever you shoot a bear and you shoot them either lung shot or heart shot, they don't just die. They kind of do like pigs do, where. They fall down, get up, and they just run full speed in the direction that they're facing, mm-hmm. right? So typically, they want you to take 200 in, in shots and put multiple shots on the bear. So I'm like, dude, I, I'm telling you, I can put a perfect shot on this bear. And he's like, we will never find it. <laughs> and yeah. I said, screw it. I'll shoot him in the head. And he's <laughs> like, dude, you don't want to shoot him in the head. And I was like, listen – and, and, you know, I'm smoked. We just hiked a mile and a half. Oh. We went from sea level to 1100 feet in two hours. Oh, I mean, God. it was and through, and that doesn't sound like, it doesn't sound like a lot whenever you're just thinking about elevation, but That's a when lot. you're, when you're hacking through all that stuff and you're going through the alders that you're crawling under you're and wearing all those clothes and you get your gear. Yeah. Carrying a pack and carrying a gun because as soon as you see a bear, basically you take your gun out of your pack because you don't know when you're going to end up having to shoot. So you're carrying a gun in one hand and you're carrying like a 20 pound pack or 30 pound pack or Wes was probably carrying a 40 pound pack. 
Um, and you're getting hung up and all this stuff. I mean, it is exhaust. I was smoked and I was like, dude, I, I don't care. I'm going to shoot him in the head. And so finally I talked Wes into it and he's like, okay. <laughs> and like right about that time, the bear disappears around a corner and I was like, maybe he'll come back. And he's like, he's not going to come back. And I was like, <laughs> okay, how do we get closer? We couldn't go straight because there's a, just a straight rock face. You know, there's no, you couldn't do it with climbing gear, you know? And, uh, I look up and it's kind of like more straight up. And I said, what if we go up and then keep going? And he's like, maybe. Nuts, and so he like, run, he, he leaves his pack there and he runs up and I see him lean back over the cliff and go, yeah, this is good. And I was like, why did I say that? <laughs> right now I got to climb this mofo. <laughs> yeah. So I handed him his pack. Uh, and then we climbed, like scaled this rock face and went through some more nasty alders. And now your got wife up. is with you this whole time, right? Yeah, dude, she killed me on that climb. I was like, you need to call Jillian Michaels personally and thank her. (laughs) Tell her you whipped my ass on this climb. And uh, we we got up to the top. Finally, we got to actually where the bear was. And we're just standing there looking around. He's gone, you know. Um, And there's a lot of places bear can go that people can't go just because they can climb stuff like it's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if there's a tiny little trail around the side of a cliff, then the bear will take it. and We can't take it, you know. Um, so who knows where he went, but it was probably the most disappointing, uh, thing I've ever done in my life. You know, your just ex- adrenaline was through the roof. Uh, well, it wasn't even that it was just, you got so much invested, you know, I've been there for two weeks mm-hmm. and, uh, just killed this mountain climbing it. You're Jones and, into, you're Jones to shoot something and you see one yeah. and it's a, it's like possibly a trophy. I mean, yeah, oh, he was a monster dude. Um, and by the time you get up to the top, you know, it's 30 degrees outside or less cause the sun has gone down now at this point and you're wearing nothing but a t-shirt and your pants, you know, because you've, you're just sweating so much while you're climbing and everything. Yeah. And then you realize uh, I got to hike back now. <laughs> oh dude. And yeah. And then we were like, well, we got to go back down now in the dark, you know, right. so you, everybody gets out their headlamps and then, uh, it took us two hours to get up there and then it took us three hours to go back down oh crap so uh, going down yeah going down one is bad though just because it's not as tiring uh there's way less energy expended going down than there is going up um but it was just the whole time i got three hours now to think about man we just lost a giant bear but there's nothing we could have done different yeah so there's no there's no other we took the best route we could have possibly taken um there was only one other option for a way that we could have gone and that would have given us about the same distance shot at about the same time. So, you know, it, it, there's nothing we could have done different. That bear just, it wasn't, you know, wasn't his day. So, yeah. um, so we hiked back down and we got back to camp at like 10 or 10 30 or something. Um, ate some dinner, went to bed and then the next day just repeat, you know, just get up and look for bears. Um, at some point it was after the bear, we're sitting there and actually it was the next day because my wife, Shauna, uh, her feet were pretty sore from doing that hike and then coming back down, her feet got wet. So, Oh yeah. That sucks. Uh, cause, cause we actually came down a Creek, um, uh, you know, and the, and all those valleys, every one of those valleys has a Creek in it. Well, you're no stranger so, to creeks, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what we went on, but you just trekked across one to get that Bobcat. I remember that. Right. It was more like so, a river. You said, Oh, it's just a Creek. Come on. <laughs> so, um, Rather than climbing the scale in the cliffs back down, we just basically made it down to the creek and then came down the creek, and it was a little easier. But obviously, you get wet doing that. Um, so yeah, don't ever believe Nick when he says it's just a creek. It's <laughs> it's a waist yeah, deep river at least. That's episode one. If anybody wants to watch it. Beastmaster Hunting episode one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's see. The next day, Wes and I went up the valley, and we're sitting there. Uh, I'm sorry. Back up a little bit. That next morning. Uh, I wake up to this howling and yipping and, uh, I walk out of the tent and Wes goes, Hey, did you hear those wolves? I said, dude, those were coyotes. And he said, no, there's no coyotes up here. I said, those were, trust me. This is what I do. Those were coyotes. <laughs> I've heard enough coyotes. And he was too. like, he's like, trust me. I'm from Alaska. We don't have these coyotes or, okay. They've got coyotes up there, but he's like, I've never seen a coyote in my life in Alaska. Yeah. And it's because coyotes are not a native species in Alaska. They're, uh, actually migrating from Canada. And, uh, I was like, yeah, well, okay, whatever. Maybe they were wolves. Uh, cause we had seen a wolf a couple days prior and, uh, 
we're sitting up there like two hours later in the valley, and here come these two coyotes trotting down the river. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> look, I told coyotes. you so. <laughs> and he's like, no shit. So uh, I said, uh, you know, is it gonna is it gonna disturb the bears if we shoot these coyotes? And he's like, no way. And I said, okay. Well, he carries a a little hand call just to squeak at bears to make them stand up if they're in the thick brush, you know. Yeah. So I was like, dude, just blow your call a couple times because these coyotes had never seen people. You know, that's what that's what's so cool about being up there. Um, so I'm Curious, laying across yeah. my pack. Yeah, I'm laying across my pack and. Uh, he just blows the call a couple times and they kind of disappear behind all this thick brush and then they pop back out and West range is one of them, uh, at like two twenty five, and I shot and hit him kind of a little bit low. It was pretty windy that day, a little bit low, uh, on the shoulder. He was facing us and he kind of does this. We, I've never seen a coyote do it. He kind of does this like shocked, like stagger. Like he has no idea what just happened. And the other one's just standing there. Because they've never heard gunshots, so they don't know what's going yeah, on. What you the know? hell? Yeah. So uh, maybe Chamber, we should have stayed one. in Canada, is what they're saying, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so that one kind of kind of starts limping around, you know, like because he's wounded, and uh, he kind of starts doing the death spin, is what we call it, where they're lung shot and they're gonna die, yeah. And they are spinning around trying to get at what's getting them, you know. Mm-hmm. And the the other coyote kind of starts biting at it. You know, because he's like, man, chill out, you know, whatever. He's going nuts, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at this Come point, on, Carl, they made it settle to, down. <laughs> right. At this point, they made it to like 200 yards and they're lined up because they're both spinning around, like kind of biting at each other. Because I don't know, maybe they think one of them's getting the other one. So I chamber another <laughs> round and I'm, I wait for him to line up and I shoot um, the front one and I aim a little high trying to get them both. Well, that one, it ends up just hitting the front coyote right in the spine and Ooh, just dropping him. Yeah, folds him, right? And the other one runs. That now now he's figured out that that sound is bad, <laughs> I guess, you know? <laughs> yeah. So the other one that's already wounded runs uh, like around this patch of trees. I chamber another one, shoot him, and it's a good like solid broadside double lung shot. And he spins off into these alders, that nasty stuff. Uh, well, we went down there, found the one that folded up, and then we spent like an hour and a half looking for the other one and never found him. Mm. Uh, and it's just because that, that stuff is so thick. Yeah. You cannot you can't walk in it, period. There's blood, there's chunks of meat, there's fur everywhere. Just can't find him. So, you know, whatever, kinda bummed. We skinned out the other one. Um and Wes is like, I've never lost an animal in my life. We're finding this coyote. And I was like, dude, it's He's a coyote. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's a coyote. Okay. If it's a wolf, I agree with you. We're gonna find him. We just fed we just fed a hungry animal with that, you know. Right, yeah. So he's like, All right, fine. So after like an hour of looking, we head back up and we glass some more and uh, call it a day. Um, The next day, we're headed back up the valley and we stop to to look through our binoculars up this mountain. And Shauna's with us and she goes, I see something. I'm like, where? She says, she like points across the river um, through the brush. You see just the back of something bouncing. And uh, I'm like, oh, and it looked like a bear just because... Like I just saw fur, uh-huh. you know, come flash up, and I thought that brush has got to be so tall that's got to be a bear. And I was like, oh, it's a bear. And I was like, no, it's a wolf. No, no, it's a coyote. <laughs> it's another coyote. <laughs> so, so Wes is like, there's no way this is another coyote. And I'm like, he's right there. Dude's Wes never is, seen a coyote in his life, and you get three. Yeah, right three, there. three, two days. And uh, so I'm like, just blow the call. He'll come out. So he blows the call and he kind of pops out and I get the gun on him and I'm waiting for uh West to range him. Cause it, it dude, everything is deceiving out there. Oh yeah. It, it's like, uh, when you, if you've ever been in any kind of Valley, when mm-hmm. you look across the Valley, everything looks, looks closer. so much closer. Than yeah. It is. Yeah. So, and he couldn't quite get a range on him before he disappeared. So we run up to the next spot where, uh, we have an opening and I lay back down on the pack and I'm like, just blow the call again. He'll come back out. So he blows the call and he pops out like inside one of those alders, you know, and all I could see was his eyes and his ears and he's looking through there at us and West ranges him and he's like 185 or something like that. 187. And, uh, I'm like, man, if I shoot him, it's just going to explode his head. <laughs> and a big deal in Alaska is, uh, they're required to keep all the fur and use it. Oh. So, even from the coyote. Okay. So I'm like, man, I don't want to just like blow him up because I wanted to keep this pelt, you know, because uh, the coyotes up there are really, really hairy, <laughs> you know, as you can imagine, because sure. they need it. Yeah. Um, 
so I'm I'm sitting there and he's not moving, he's not moving, and uh, if he went left, we would never find him. If he went right, we wouldn't be able to see where he went. So I was like, I'm just gonna wait for him. Maybe he'll turn his head and I can shoot him in the neck or something, you know, through this little bitty like six inch hole that I can see him through. And uh, he's, Wes is like, yeah, just do that. So he turns his head and I shoot him and he does the death spin <laughs> off off to the left, like off to the left into the stuff that you can't walk through. And I'm like. Not again. <laughs> you know, so we get up there, find a big poof of fur and a couple of chunks of meat. And then, you know, you look and there's 400 yards of stuff you can't walk in. You oh, know, and I'm like, no. oh, man, it's so frustrating. I should have just shot him in the head, you know. But <laughs> this guy's dude, looking at you like, I've never lost an animal. I've lost two yeah, with this yeah. guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, he hated me. No, I'm just kidding. Um uh, because they were good shots, you know. The problem is I was shooting bullets that are designed to shoot bears, yeah. you know. So it's a bullet that's designed for penetration. So I'm sure it just smoked a little bitty hole through these coyotes, yeah. you know. And, and doesn't expand like the bullets that we shoot um, coyotes here. But I was like, man, I don't know. I don't know what I could do different on these coyotes other than, you know, put it directly on their shoulder. But that wasn't an option on this one. Yeah. Um. So anyway, lost that coyote. We looked for him for like two hours because it was right the first thing in the morning. Um, so it's like day three out there? Oh, it's like day six or seven. Oh, while you're so, out in the bush? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, because it was like day six when we saw the big bear up the mountain. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah. So Get my time I, I mean, frame back here. Oh, dude, it's like the time out there is just, it goes by so slow but so fast at the same time. Um. So anyway, we couldn't find him. And we hiked our spot up the valley, keep glassing, keep glassing. Um, that same day or the next day, Rick, the camera guy, uh, we split up because it was getting down to the wire, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were both looking for bears. Well, he ended up shooting a bear on the beach, um, which is it was a pretty good bear. Now, the beach, uh, that's where your uh, main camp was? Right. Yeah, he shot it like uh, 200 yards from the tent. Oh, damn. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> he well, if you're at the spot that he shot it at, if you get up on this point, you could see like a mile in each direction. Yeah. So it was kind of like the crossroads, you know, where the bears cross. Gotcha. Um, so he got his bear and then uh, headed out that same day because we didn't know what the weather would be like the next few days. And How then, big was his bear? Um, I don't know. They said it was like a seven footer, which that's that's measured nose to tail. Mm-hmm. Um, the bear that we were looking at up on the mountain was like a nine and a half footer. So, I mean, there's, there's, it, it's, it was a good bear, but it wasn't the blonde bear up on the mountain. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, and then, um, the next day my wife headed out because she had to be back at work. Like the day we were scheduled, the day after we were scheduled to get back. And with the weather, after seeing those guys stranded for a week on the mountain, I was like, just take when the a window good. of opportunity and get out of there. Yeah, exactly. Cause it didn't matter if I ended up stuck. Um, so then uh, the next day after that, we ended up getting like an inch and a half of snow, like blizzard, white out. So couldn't hunt that day. I mean, we did hunt that day, but you couldn't see anything. Um, and then the last day was the day uh, that it was all sunny and just snow everywhere. And it was really cool. Like, this is what you imagine hunting in Alaska to be. But there uh, wasn't any bears to be had. No bears, so, huh? Well, not for me. Rick got his. Well, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean it was it was cool and it uh, it was definitely an awesome experience. I was disappointed that I didn't get a bear, but just the you know it's it's the adventure the experience. Yeah, it's the adventure, yeah. the experience, just being out there. Yeah, uh, the last day though, I'm sitting there like, is it duck season? No. Oh man, <laughs> what is that? Th- what is that thing? It's an otter. Can I shoot the otter? <laughs> no. Really, can I shoot this? Can Damn I shoot it. that? What is that? Hey, look at that fox <laughs> over there. Get, hey, hey, can I shoot a fox? No. Damn it. <laughs> Maybe we'll get more coyotes, you know? <laughs> right. Well, I was going to say, you know, always... at least you got, you know, you got some coyotes. You got a little, got a little trigger yeah. time. And you got to see that big bear, too. I mean, that had to have been. And oh, even though dude, you didn't yeah. get to, you know, take a shot at him, I mean, that's still, that's a yeah, highlight. And you've got it on film, too. So that, that was cool. Yeah. So the episode, um, you know, like I said, it'll be a lot different than what people are used to if they've been watching episode one through five. Um, it's a lot more of just uh, here's us hiking through Alaska. Here's us being miserable in Alaska. Here's some landscape. Uh, and uh, we didn't even get really good video of the coyote shot just because we didn't have Shauna uh, that day. So oh, bummer. It, uh, but, you know, I mean, it's um, 
I think I think if people have been watching any of the other episodes, then they'll find some entertainment value in this one, just different. And I actually set out when I did uh, when I started doing the episodes on YouTube is I didn't want to be one of those like never kill anything hunting shows. I wanted to like something dies every episode, <laughs> you know, <laughs> preferably a lot of pigs or a lot of coyotes because yeah. if we don't, we don't hunt game animals, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I mean, we do hunt game animals. It's just none of the episodes have been game animals. And it came down to, I was like, well, you know, I shot some coyotes, so we'll go ahead and make an episode just, and then that, it fit my criteria. And at the same time, it wasn't just, uh, you know, just a whole bunch of filming for nothing. We had hundreds and hundreds of hours of filming that I cut down to 28 minutes, you know? Oh my God. Uh, yeah. So it, a lot uh, of editing. It only took me like two hours to edit it. So it wasn't bad. Well, that's not bad. And plus I don't use any music or anything like that or any crazy effects or, uh, I don't have some intro or, you know, it's, 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 I like, I, I dislike the hunting shows where it's like, there's the bear. And then it's like, dun, 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 right. Dun, dun. Doing all kinds you know, of got, crazy camera tricks and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like got the suspenseful music going and everything like that. And I'm like, dude, we know he's stalking the bear. You don't have to have you know <laughs> the fight sequence from Star Wars episode right. whatever, you know? Um <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. It's uh stuff like that. It makes it easier on me for editing and at the same time. I think it's less cheesy and people maybe will appreciate it more because it's really more like you're there. Um, more realistic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cause there's not any music playing in my head, you know? Right. <laughs> not when I'm out shooting is completely different. Yeah. Right. So let's talk about your gear. We're going to talk about the, the gear that you use. We haven't talked about your rifle, or your, your scopes or, you know, your, yeah. uh, your gear. Let's uh, talk about that. What, uh, so how'd you, uh, how'd you dress? Where'd you get your, boots sharply all that kind of stuff and well you said you had some time to, to gather some gear and <laughs> research uh, it a the, little bit and yeah i had like six or eight trip. months to uh to prep for the hunt and that basically led to me just researching everything that i wanted to get to take there because you know i've never hunted outside of texas uh before this hunt oh really and okay really i didn't yeah. know that i've hunted my entire life but it's all been in texas it's all been in and texas in Texas, you don't need much more than uh, some jeans and some coveralls, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, so for it. that night we went, I was pretty damn cold. That's true, but, <laughs> cold. you know, I, I, I still think that day I was just wearing some long johns and some, some tall boots and a jacket, and that's about it, you know? Yeah, I think my problem was I didn't have... Um, I didn't have gloves, I don't think is what it was. My, and my yeah. hands were getting like really freaking cold because we were up on that uh, that metal contraption that you had built around your truck. <laughs> So, yeah, up on the rack. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I did a lot of research and I was, uh, I'm not scared to buy high end gear, uh, because I know that I'm going to use it. And it, I mean, it's kind of the same theory on guns, uh, a three or $4,000 rifle really doesn't scare me. Right. Um, so, you know, I started with, uh, researching like Sitka and first light and Kuyu and, um, a bunch of other brands. And I ended up on Kuyu because, uh, for one, their business model, spell um, that. <clears throat> Kuyu, K-U-I-U. Okay. Um, so uh, part of it is because I really like the company and I like how it's structured and I like their, um, I don't know, I just I just like the way they do things. But I've never uh, heard of them. So are they <clears throat> are they specifically like cold weather kind of kind of gear? They are they are an ultralight um, hunting clothing company geared towards mountain hunting. So um, you've heard have you heard of Sitka? Sitka? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Sitka is uh, basically uh, a high-end clothing company for hunting that um, the founder of Kuyu, I don't know if he was a founder of Sitka or if he was just one of the high level, uh, one of the higher level involvement or involved guys. Mm -hmm. Um, But basically he left Sitka because he was trying to get them to use higher-end materials and higher-end products. The problem with that is whenever you start using basically the best material you can get is then the price becomes unobtainable. Of course, yeah. (laughs) Because in the the way clothing works is if if I'm the manufacturer – and I make it for a hundred dollars, and you're the dealer. I sell it to you for two hundred dollars, and then you sell it, it to the public for four hundred. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, the way Kuyu works is they don't have any retailers. They sell. They only sell consumer direct. Okay. okay. So you can only buy it online from Kuyu. 
which allows them to make a jacket for $150 and then sell it to you for $300. But because it, it was $50 more for them to make it because it is, it costs them more to make it, yeah. but they sell it for less in the end right. because they're only marketing. There's up no one. middleman. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And okay, so, and they have an outlet. I'm on their website right now. They've got an outlet, so they've got yeah, stuff that's on like stuff, sale. <laughs> that's stuff that's been returned. Uh, you know, like somebody, cause, and that's part of their deal is since you can't go somewhere and try it all on, then you can order it, and if it doesn't fit, they just exchange it for you. Yeah, you know, um, and then that's stuff that's been sent back for exchange or whatever on the outlet. Yeah, uh, but uh, well, these prices aren't that bad. No, they're not bad at all, and not whenever you're talking about. Not whenever you look at the quality that you're right. getting. Okay, this so, type of clothing, yeah, exactly. So and plus, it's all made to be ultra light. Um, everything that they use, the best, the best nylon, the best uh, polyester, the best down, uh, the best wool. Everything is merino wool out of New Zealand. So I mean, there's no compromise anywhere. And when you look at a jacket that the warmth is the equivalent to like a big coat that I would wear down here, but it only weighs. Um, like 12 ounces. I mean, that's crazy. When you start adding everything up, you know, that you're carrying, um, you can take pounds. Ounces out of, or pounds, yeah. Well, you can take pounds out of your clothing. That's crazy, you know. So, like, it was uh, 15 degrees or so one morning when we woke up. The wind chill was in the single digits. And I was wearing a layer of wool, um, like a base layer, long johns, basically, mm -hmm. from Kuyu. Um, I was wearing one pair of pants, a vest and, um, uh, an insulation jacket and my rain jacket and that's it. And I was not cold at all. So, I mean, that's like, that it's, it's less clothing than you were wearing that night that are usually so cold that we were hunting. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but because of the way it's engineered and the material it's made out of. It looks you, like it, they got their own little camo pattern too. Yeah. Yeah, they got a couple of them. Uh, the one that I like is the uh, Verde 2.0. Um, so it's kind of like a digital green and black and gray. But yeah, so I mean, it's it's kind of like I told Wes um, when we were walking around, I was like, man, I feel kind of gay. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, what are you talking about? And, he's like, and I was like, look at me. Everything I've got on, I'm everything I'm wearing, my backpack, my everything says Kuyu. And he's like... Hey, if it works, it works. You know? <laughs> and, he's, and he's right, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, even their packs are like, uh, it's a carbon fiber frame. So it's designed to be ultra light, like a pack that can hold enough stuff to camp in like all of your food and your entire camp. And the whole pack weighs like six pounds, Yeah, you know, so, but you can put 150 pounds of stuff in it, you know, nice. but that's six pounds when you're talking about. Um, everybody else's packs are 10 pounds. Well, I mean, it's four pounds that you shaved out of just your pack, you know? <clears throat> so, well, that, that's anyway. the thing. If you can lighten up your gear, then you, well, I mean, as far as like your clothing and your pack, yeah. if you can like, then you can carry more supplies and, and other things. It allows you yeah, to, or just, to, or just go further to have essential. Know? Yeah. Or go further. Yeah, exactly. Go further, faster, uh, and not put as much wear on your joints and your back and everything like that. So, um, and it did make a difference. So you know, how did I, you learn how to pronounce this? Did you call these people? Apparently you called these people cause you got a lot of, <laughs> a lot of info on their stuff. I, I called them multiple times. <laughs> um, because you know, anytime I had a question, I'd call them and ask them. Are you a brand uh, ambassador for them now? I wish dude. Um, they don't do any kind of sponsorships or anything. Really? Uh, yeah. I paid retail for everything that I bought and I bought pretty much one of everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, um, that's the way I am, man. Once I find something that I like, yeah, it's like cool. The cool, uh, clothing yeah, line. Cool clothing. Yeah. Uh, I've, I found that they fit me better than any clothing I've ever had in my life. And then I'm yeah. like you, I went and I, and I bought one of everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously, I think I've got every jacket that they make. I've got every pair of gloves that they make. I've got every pair of pants that they make. I've got a set of down. I've got a, Did you get their synthetic. sleeping bags? No. Did you uh, get the sleeping bag? <laughs> I got, I got a synthetic insulated jacket. Um, I got, uh, two sets of the rain gear. One is the really heavy rain gear for Alaska. One is the really ultralight packing pack down rain gear. And I'm taking that to Idaho in January for a cat hunt. Um, 
And I mean, like, uh, it's ridiculous how much money I've spent there. My wife is like, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> yeah, she's like, like come okay, on, here, come on. Here's dude. an example of how awesome their stuff is. The gators. You know what gators are? They go over your boots. Yeah, yeah. Got, <clears> I okay, saw so, they had some of those. Yes. So I was wearing Zamberlin. Um, they're called Zamberlin Cougar boots. And they're just a waterproof, leather, really high-quality Italian hiking boot uh, that's designed for hunting. And I was um, – so I was wearing those put my rain pants on uh the the kuyu rain pants and then i would put my kuyu uh i think they're called the yukon gators on over that and i was walking in water that was over the top of my gators and it was and my feet were still dry uh, nice. so like knee deep water but it's not getting in through my pants or my gators or my boots so i mean that that was i was impressed by that i think the thing that i was most surprised by was how much i wore the vest uh, I was on the fence because I'm not a vest guy, but yeah, I'm not it. either. I, I haven't really gotten into the vest. I wore it every day, all day. I even slept in it sometimes, and it was just for the convenience of like I had to have my license and tag on me all the time, so I would just keep it in my vest pocket. <clears throat> Whenever I would shed layers, um, I would just get down to just the vest and my uh, and my long johns. Basically, um, it was just one of those things that it served a great purpose for. If you were going to keep one thing on all the time, you want your core yeah. to be the warmest. So, and that's, right. I mean, I see the, so, I understand the purpose of vest. I just, dude, it was ridiculous. And I hate doing stuff like that. But when you find something that is, I'm with I you. Mean, I understand. It's, it's perfect. It's just a little bit expensive. But I mean, if you're looking for something that's really, really good, then, you know, you're going to pay for it. Did you get the pants <laughs> too? Got the britches and everything? All of them. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> there's I think the, I think the only pair of pants them. I didn't get were the. Uh, Did you get the um, boxer briefs? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> they got boxer no, briefs I too. I didn't. I did get some uh, some specific boxers for this trip from Ex Officio. Ex Officio. Uh, Never heard of them. Yeah, they're like uh, they're like a treated deal where you can wear them for multiple days, just wash them in water, and then they've got uh, like an antimicrobial treatment on them yeah those chinook pants look awesome they are the most comfortable pants i've ever worn that pair of pants is the chinook yes they look they're like awesome it. they've, they've got like a built-in a checkered pad. they've got like a checkered yeah the knee pads don't really do anything but uh they've got like a checkered fleece inside uh on them like a grid fleece uh-huh and they're super comfortable um the uh the wool and everything was all real warm <clears throat> let's see what else what else did I wear? The Zamberlin boots we already talked about. But your boot. What about your um, your headgear? Do you have some headgear? I just had a just a a a beanie that I got from REI like I don't know ten years ago. Just a fleece beanie, and it was enough because all the jacket layers that I was wearing had hoods. So you know, by the time you put on three hoods, you're good. <laughs> yeah. Man, you think they would have thrown you a beanie in for all that stuff you ordered from me? <laughs> well, the problem is I didn't order it like all at once. I just went through oh, and kind of like got. I, I would be like, yeah, yeah, I need that. Yeah, I need that too. Yeah, I need that. So I probably paid like three hundred dollars in shipping by the time it was all done. <laughs> but um, the oh, the you asked about sleeping bag. I ordered a um, a zero degree quilt from Enlightened Equipment, um, and. A, the way a quilt differs in, from a sleeping bag is it you can just open it up and use it like a quilt. Yeah. Um, the one the one that I got is actually kind of like a hybrid deal. You can zip it all the way up. Most of them, most quilts you can't zip all the way is up. Is it a zip up quilt? <clears throat> Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't do a sleeping bag at all? No. No, it's just uh, a quilt that zips up on. Is it like uh, waterproof? No, not at all. It's a uh, it's a down uh, quilt, so you definitely don't want to get it wet. Oh. Okay. But. You Carry it in a waterproof bag, you know, and then whenever you get it in the tent, you pop it out. Um, I used a, uh, what is it, a Thermarest Exolite uh, sleeping pad. That was, thing was awesome. It's like uh, basically just a blow-up, kind of single-person blow-up mattress, but it, what mm -hmm. it does is it gives you an air barrier between the cold, you know, so you it, it provides a level of warmth. Um, but it's an air blow-up? It's, it's an air mattress? Yeah, okay. yeah. How did you arrest. blow it up? Did your mouth blow it up, or did you have a pump? Yeah, no, no, no. It's very small. It's it's like um, I don't know, two feet wide and six feet long. Gotcha. So it's it's, it's super small. Fits on a cot. Yeah, it's like exactly the size of a cot. Um, right. 
What's some other stuff? I used an Alaskan Guide Creations bino harness for my binoculars. Um, oh, dude, you didn't get one of Kuyu's? They got they got bino harnesses too. I have one now. <laughs> <laughs> you already had one. Like I got that. Uh, no, I got it when we got back. Um, oh, I liked I, the, I liked the Alaskan Guide Creations, and I got it because the binoculars that I was using were too big for one of the Kuyu's. Um, the, the thing I didn't like about it is it was pretty heavy, like for what it is. Yeah. Uh, and, um, it just, the straps kind of like just got in the way. I There's a you. lot of straps to it, but you, you, you really do need a bino harness for that kind of hunting Yeah. because you're looking through your binoculars every 30 seconds. Yeah. You know? I spent probably. What binos did you use? Uh, for this trip, I was using a pair of, um, Canon image stabilization 10 by 42s and, these things are cool. You put batteries in them, and when you're just standing there holding them, you click a button, and there's a gyro in there that like stabilizes the image, like camera technology. Oh, that's cool. Um, so you can you can just hold them up, and it's like looking through it's a self stabilizes. Tripod. Yeah, that's yeah, that's they're neat. awesome. Downfall is they're heavy because uh, uh, they got batteries and they have all that technology in them. So yeah. when I got back, I actually talked to. Um, one of the guys that I know at Swarovski and ordered some 10 by 42 Swaros. And <sighs> dude, you should talk to me. I could have hooked you up with Ride On. They've got some awesome binoculars. With who? Ride On. Ride On USA. Oh, the yeah, official yeah, yeah. optics of Talking Lead. Uh, I didn't know you had an official optics, but I do dude, now. <laughs> Swaro, it's, I mean, come on. Swaro glass is hard to beat. Uh, so. Right <clears throat> On. I'm telling you, dude. You'd <laughs> They're be, good. You'd be, yes, you would be very impressed with their glass. Well, uh, I have to look at it at a shot show. Yeah, absolutely. We'll set you up. I may have you. I may have some sent out to you before then. Uh, yeah, I'll take a look at them. Yeah, they got a um, ten by forty two binocular. That's I tell yeah, you, dude. Everybody that I've put their eyes on this thing, the first words out of their mouth are like, "Holy, this is clear." Yeah, the 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 uh, it'll be neat to look at them next to the right next to the Swaros too. Yeah, but yeah, I'll take a look at them for sure. I don't have any. Uh, allegiance to anybody when it comes to optics um well we need to change that (laughs) the uh let's see what else what uh, what other gear is there let's see so we talked about your your boots socks what kind of socks did you wear uh you know i had some ski socks that i took that were some merino wool or smart wool sorry um and i wore the same socks for 11 days straight never took them off wow so yeah i mean you don't socks Dude, you don't wear, I mean, you don't, uh, it's different when you're in a spike camp because you get done hunting, <clears throat> you walk down, you drop your pack, you go in, cook your food, eat and take off your shoes or you take off your gaiters, take off your rain pants, take off, basically get down to your base layer and just get in bed. You know, and you just get in your sleeping bag and go to sleep. <laughs> right. You, you got time uh, to be changing clothes and all that kind of crap. Yeah. yeah you know, there's not really a need to, you know, I, I, I think, uh, I took three pair of boxers for 11 days. I used two. You know, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's the only, because the lighter you can go, the better. Yeah, know? absolutely. Yeah. Um, I did take two sets of uh, thermals because I didn't know exactly what the temperature range was going to be. Yeah. Uh, so I took a lighter set and a heavier set, and by the end of it, I ended up in the heavier set. But it was more than enough. Yeah. Um, and that's something you know, that people need to be aware of, probably for Alaska, is like you said, you know, the temperature there can change. Yeah. You know from day to day. So you never know what you're going to get. You get rain, you get the snow, you get the wind. Yeah. And, and base layers, it's not a bad idea to have two sets anyway, even if they're the same weight, because if they're the same weight and you needed to, you could double them up. Yeah. Um, or if you end up falling in a river, you know, and you got to strip everything off to dry it out, then you got another set you could put on. Right. Um, uh, and then, um, uh, the da- you know, down is an important thing to have in your pack, um, down jacket and down pants, even if you're not going to use them, Put them in a, uh, a roll top dry bag, just a waterproof bag, and then just stuff it down the bottom of your pack. My down jacket and down pants together weigh less than a pound, oh, so there's wow. no re- there's no reason not to carry them. Makes and a good pillow down. too. Yeah, yeah, and uh, they pack down to almost nothing, <clears throat> um, but you always keep it in your pack because if for some reason you're up on the mountain and you know who knows somebody falls off and dies and you fall off and break your ankle trying to save them, then you just put on your down and crawl up under a tree and go to sleep, There you, go. <laughs> you know, because if you didn't have that, you, you could die, you yeah. know, it's, and it's basically From like exposure, being a, right. It, and it's basically like being in a sleeping bag when you're wearing that down or, you know, let's just say we get some crazy weather and we're snowed in for two weeks. 
um, and it's really cold. Well, then you put your down on inside your sleeping bag, and now you've like doubled the warmth of your the sleeping bag. Of your sleeping bag, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a now. That, did you that, um did you pack and prepare for uh, a medical emergency? Like you said, you know, you, somebody could fall yeah. and break their their ankle. Do you yeah. pack that stuff, or is that something that the guides are responsible for? Um, the guides do the the guides do have it, and and they're um. They have more stuff even than I did, but I did have like just because I'm, you know, a former law enforcement, so I've always got kind of stuff like that with me. But I had um, a tourniquet. This is what I carried with me every day, all day. Um, a tourniquet, um, like a set of gauze and uh, an ace bandage, um, you know, and, and pretty much with that, you can stabilize anything other than a gunshot, yeah. <laughs> you know. De- well, depending on where the gunshot is. Sure. But um, – you know, I'm not really worried about uh, a gunshot out there because I'm the only one with a gun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, well, okay, yeah. the guy had a gun. Yeah, but, you could uh, get a branch through your leg or, you know, yeah, a yeah, rock, yeah. even you get a rock through your leg or your arm or whatever, yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, the the thing that I was uh, preparing for was like a bad cut from something or uh, a broken bone. Yeah. You know, so... Um, but, uh, yeah, like, uh, Wes had this deal, one of those, like, almost like a stapler thing to stitch stuff up, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know so, about. so if you had a real bad cut, then you could, uh, <laughs> you just staple you, it up. You could treat it that way. But yeah, so just gauze, um, gauze, ace bandage, and a tourniquet. tourniquet. And that, uh, you know, that, I, I feel pretty secure that I could, uh, keep myself or somebody else alive for quite a while with just those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, really, I mean, and, and really the only thing that you're not going to be able to fix with or stabilize with that is, uh, some kind of chest wound. Mm-hmm. But man, if you, if you punctured a lung or something out there in the, you're, <laughs> yeah, you're might, dead. As, might as well just <laughs> ring the dinner bell. <laughs> Call it over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. And that's actually, oh, one of the things <laughs> I did ring have the dinner um, bell. <laughs> yeah, was, a uh, this deal that Garmin makes called a Garmin in reach. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's basically just a GPS um, that tracks your location. You can set it to track where you've hiked and everything like that. You can tag different locations and stuff. But you can also send uh, text messages and emails from it. And it uses satellite to do it. So it's pretty cool. Um, so I had that with me whenever we would go hike out. Um, and then there's an SOS button on it that if you push, then it alerts some emergency response center. And then they call whoever. But the problem is... There's nobody to call, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're going to call like the Coast Guard or something. And then it's going to be like two days before they can get there. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, cause if weather it, permitting. You know, yeah, exactly. Well, and you know, the weather is really bad and it's really hard to get in and out of camps there, but it's also partly because you're not allowed to use helicopters for hunting at all. Not so, even to like get in and get out. Exactly. Why? Yeah, it's, Why not? It's illegal. I, you know, and, and it would have made it easier. And I assume that's why, because there were like that spot on the mountain where I told you those other guys were stuck for a week. Right. A, a helicopter could have got in there. No problem. Um, why would they plane, for, for instances not. like that to get people out? Why Unless not? It's because, okay. So if it is an actual emergency, somebody's going to die, then you call for help. Then you can get a helicopter and get up there and get them. But uh, they just fly in, get the people, and leave. They don't get any of their stuff. Um, and I assume you'd have to forfeit your animal because yeah. then you're going to have people abuse it. You know, oh no, it's an emergency. Come get me. <laughs> but you know, if if you're out there and you're not dying, so is then, it to keep people from spotting? Is that what it is? No, I think it's from to keep people from getting to tough areas to hunt easy. You okay. know, so basically I, just to keep their their game at to keep yeah to keep levels, the sports certain the way levels. it is. Yeah, but you can use a plane, so, okay. uh, but no helicopter. That's but surprising. Yeah, so, I, I wouldn't have thought that, but that's good to know, I guess. Yeah, so, um, the, so that not, Garmin was pretty cool. So you did have that Garmin with you, okay. Yeah, it was cool, and I could, so I could text my mom. She was staying with the dogs. Like, she she comes in town and, and dog sits for us, so I could text her every day. How are the dogs? Right. <laughs> you know, uh, they miss like me, that. don't they? Yeah, don't you know, haven't met. Have you met Ripley? Lady. Did we have Ripley? Yeah, you had Ripley. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, Ripley was like on my shoulder the whole time we were doing. Yeah, Ripley's crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it um, <clears throat> that came in handy. Just being able to text and email was was pretty cool. Any other kind not... of special special gear or gadgets that you had for for this hunt? 
Um, man, not really. Um, I you, tried to trim it down as much as possible. Yeah, and you mentioned that uh, your rifle you were using a three hundred win mag, and um, yeah, what was the, what were the optics you were using? Uh, so I ended up borrowing a rifle for this hunt because my rifle wasn't ready in time. Um, but Beastmaster hunting, we actually have uh, a bolt gun prototype that we're working on. I using know, proof, we talked about that. Yeah, yeah. Using a, a proof research barrel, so I was hoping that would be ready. Um, but it's going to be a 300 Win Mag. Um, and I went out and test fired it the other day, and it shoots awesome. So there's just a few little Sweet. things we got to tweak. Um, Is this going to be a bolt gun? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so and and, uh, and I I had in mind the the mountain gun type rifle, you know. So it's uh man, Proof Research has done so much with these carbon fiber barrels. It's ridiculous. It's a 24 inch barrel that's like the profile of like a Sendero profile. I think is what it's called. So in an AR platform, we would call it a bull barrel. That's about how big it is. Oh. Um. How much that weigh? So the barrel is some crazy like two pounds lighter than a steel barrel. Um, because I haven't weighed just the barrel, fiber. But, right? But the barrel and the stock, the stock I'm using is one from Stockies, and it's their carbon fiber stock. Um, and uh, the whole gun put together with no optic on it weighs six pounds. Oh my gosh! So, yeah, and then and what's the length you know, barrel? A 24 inch barrel. 24 so, inch I mean, barrel. Holy cow, dude! Yeah, so you really get the ballistic performance that you can get out of a 300 Win Mag. You don't you don't lose anything. <clears throat> um, but I was hoping that would be ready. It just didn't. I didn't quite pan out. But yeah. uh, I, I'm hoping, or I'm thinking, I'm going to get it to get to take it on my cat hunt uh, in Idaho. So when's that going to be? January. Okay, so. so January Idaho cat hunt. Yeah, right before Shot Show. So I'm going to go to Idaho. Hopefully, find a big mountain lion and then. Fly back and then fly out shot. <laughs> okay. Well, then we'll just plan on uh, talking about that at SHOT Show then. We could do that. Talk about yeah. the hunt at SHOT Show. Yeah, that'd be I, cool. Who's going with you on that? Just me. I'm flying solo. Going you solo? Go? Dude, you I should go. I don't know if I can swing that or not with the with the shot being that close. Yeah. It's January, I think the 3rd is the day I have to be there. Yeah. I so it's like, two, it's like three weeks before SHOT Show, I guess. We'll talk about that off air. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. That's but, tempting. Uh, That's tempting. Yeah, it's cool. Um the 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 place we're going to hunt or I'm going to hunt is uh um uh, like 3 of the top 10 Boone and Crockett cats have come out of this like valley or this range. Um Now are you the, going with an outfit or you just you're yeah, yeah everything solo? No, no, no. Yeah, I'm going with an outfitter. Okay. So you're going to have like a guide? Right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know anything in Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> well, be, no, I mean, you are, you are the the consummate researcher, so I'm sure you've been on like Google Earth, and you know, that's true. You know, I really have a lot of respect for these guys that go out and do public land hunts just on their own. Um, I think I would, I would really like to do something like that. It's just, it's a lot of time and money to commit to something that you're unsure about. You yeah, know, right. Um, and and I'm not saying unsure about killing an animal. I'm saying. I I don't have the first clue where to start if I went to Idaho or Montana or Wyoming and did a public land hunt. Um, right. You know, I might get out there and it'd be a hundred miles of nothing, like no animals. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but uh, that's something that I would like to do. Uh, just do a deep public land hunt where you you know there's no vehicles allowed. You got to just hike and carry all your stuff. Just all you, cool. all manpower. Yeah, that'd be cool. Be pretty neat. That would be cool. Well, very good. So, uh, the Alaska trip, I mean, it was kind of a bust, but at the same time, you got a lot out of it, it seems like. I yeah. Mean, not, not got a lot just of, the experience. Lot of testing and, yeah. A lot of testing, good adventure, and got to try out some uh, new, some new gear. Sounds like. Yep. Tried, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's the, that's the big thing is you get to go confirm that all this stuff that you research so hard is, uh, is actually as badass as, actually as, works. uh, on paper, you know? Um, so that gives you a lot more confidence going on the next trip. Uh, and I did take, uh, some extra stuff, uh, clothing wise that I ended up not even unpacking. And so that, you know, for next time now I don't have to even pack it. So, right. You're like, I don't even need it. Yeah. Right. So I don't see any of your pictures on the uh, QU nation. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. They, they like, I guess if you tag that or whatever, then they yeah, might share hashtag QU nation. And then, yeah, you can uh, go to their, like uh, a yeah. website, Instagram page. and Yeah. I did post some pictures where like one morning my boots were frozen solid. Um, 
doing all the water crossings and stuff. Right. So like uh, for the last three mornings, I had to wake up, put my boots on and walk into the river to, to tie them because like they were just frozen solid. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I need, I need to, to tag some of their stuff on there. I posted some on, on Facebook. I haven't posted anything on Instagram, I don't think. Yeah, I'm on yeah. your Instagram right now. I don't see anything. So are you going to, uh, you got any hunts between now and January you're going to be doing? Um, probably just local stuff, coyotes, bobcats, fox, pigs. Uh, we're going out about once a week right now. Now, so. uh, Tennessee deer season's already started. Uh, rifle season is next week, next weekend, mm-hmm. not this coming mm-hmm. weekend, but next weekend. Uh, yeah. so I'm, I'm planning on going out for that. Yeah. We're already in uh, rifle season. It started, um, I guess last weekend, so okay. four, four days ago. You going to be doing any uh, deer hunting? You know, if the occasion arises and I have a chance to go, then I probably will. But deer hunting in Texas is not entertaining to me because it's you go sit in a deer stand. Um, it's not really spot and stalk type hunting like we do with uh, predators or like we do with pigs. Yeah. You know, and, that, and that's really the entertainment to me. I don't really like to just go sit in a deer stand and watch a deer feeder. Um, right. Now, I know that somebody, night that you and I went or those those few nights that we went, Yeah, there were deer everywhere. Remember that? Yeah. We were seeing deer yeah. everywhere. Yeah. There's a lot of, I mean, if you wanted to just go kill a deer, then you could pretty much just, I could call anybody whose land we predator hunt on that doesn't have a deer lease on it and just be like, Hey, can I come out and kill a deer? And they're like, yeah, I could just go out there at sunrise, pull into a pasture, shoot a doe and be done. And be you know, uh, and just so, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Take it to the processor and drop it off. We actually just, um, had a calf butchered up at Zane's, you know, Zane. Yeah. Yeah. Zane. Um, he runs a huge cattle operation. They had a calf that didn't make weight, um, so he fed it out for a few months for me, and I bought it from him and had it butchered. So we got a whole. We got, you got all we the got meat whole, you need. <laughs> we got a whole. We got a whole freezer full of calf calf meat. There you um, go. So yeah, I mean the the for deer meat, it wouldn't really serve a purpose for me right now. Gotcha. Um, well, that's good. But you know, if somebody calls and says I got this huge buck running around out here, then I might go put some effort in. But it doesn't, you know. Like I said, it doesn't really, uh, it's not entertaining to me. Yeah. I don't like getting up early. <laughs> and and you got, I mean, I guess for deer hunting out there, you can't do like we do for the pigs and all that. You act, Is that the only way you can hunt them is like the deer stand? Uh, no, I mean, you could, you could, uh, technically you could, if you're on private property, you could drive around your vehicle. When you see them, you could get out of your vehicle and, you know, put a stock on them or whatever. Um, you can't like use your vehicle to jump them out of the brush or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, can you still but, use the the night vision and and all that no, for deer no. hunting? Still, you can't do it. Okay. You can use it. Okay, so technically, you could have a thermal optic on your rifle and use it for deer hunting, but you have to shoot them during the day. Okay, so, you can't you shoot know them at night. Same thing here. Yeah. Yeah. Can't shoot them but you but you could use a thermal because there's nothing saying that you can't. You just have to shoot them during legal hunting hours for deer. Right. Which is like. 30 minutes before daylight and 30 minutes after sunset or whatever, 30 minutes. A- I can't remember. I, I don't even hunt them enough to know. Right. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, for mule deer, it's a little different out, way out in West Texas. It's more spot and stock. Um, you know, you just spend all day glass in the side of a West Texas mountain. And when you see one, you go after it. So yeah, I don't know. It just doesn't tickle my fancy. I got you. I got you. Well, and I haven't yeah. had deer meat probably in about three years so i'm kind of due for some it and it's good oh, it's yeah. real good don't get me wrong i've shot uh two deer just right here behind our house because uh, i've actually got a deer feeder up the hill i don't think we ever went up there whenever when you were no here. we never did go up we just uh just kind of stayed down below there. yeah we got all, we so had all kinds of action down there yeah we're on uh ten and a half acres which is uh about the smallest that you can legally uh, shoot on so I put a deer feeder up there just, you know, if I wanted to go get some deer meat, I could. But yeah. uh, it's not, uh, I don't know, it's just not my. Not my bag, not, man. It's not, not my bag. bag. And and hunting, uh, you know, I like guides and outfitters. The idea is awesome and it's cool, but, man, it's expensive. Yeah, you know? it is. Uh, no doubt about it. Because they're, they're making a living and they're doing a good job at it. Yeah. Well, and the time, too, that you, I mean, like you said, you guys were out for yeah three weeks. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the entire bear season. So October yeah. 1st to October 21st. That's it. Oh, that's so, it. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, there's other hunting seasons up there, but that's bear season. That's the bear so, season. That's yeah. The I mean, so there's, 
there's a limited time for them to make money and and shop around you know if you're gonna if you're looking for an outfitter shop around but they're all going to be about the same price yeah so then we'll give them a so, give them a plug again what's their the name of the company in the website so leadheads yeah it's bushwhackalaska.com okay bushwhackalaska.com yeah okay yeah bushwhack alaska but wax w-h-a-c-k gotcha um and then there's Talaric Creek Lodge.com, I think. Let me look at that one. I think that's just one of his other ones. Yeah, Talaric Creek Lodge.com. Okay. <clears throat> and that's that's like the fishing side of their business. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. T-A-L-A-R-I-K Creek Lodge.com. Got it. Um, but, uh, yeah. So there you then, go, guys. You don't have to do any research. Uh, Nick's already done all that for you. Just call these guys <laughs> up and <laughs> the, uh, tell them Nick sent you. Yeah, I think this is them. So Wes, my guide, and his brother, who is our pilot, Luke. Uh, yeah, this is them. Uh, they actually on their own or run their own guide service too. Uh, so a lot of the guides up there, they all know each other and they all work together. Yeah. So like during bear season, they get hired by one outfitter, and then during moose season or whatever, they run their own outfit stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and it's Tyrell's uh, Tyrell's Trails dot com. T y r r e l l S trails.com house of Tyrell. <laughs> right. <No. laughs> From the, uh, uh, what's the name of that show? The game of Thrones. Uh, game, game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, Very cool. but yeah, the, the, those guys are awesome and I wouldn't hesitate to go hunting with them. Nice. Well, Nick, we've been on here for damn near two and a half hours. So. Dude, it's like so long. When I was like, I told hey, you we had a lot to talk about, didn't I? Who's going to be on the show with us? And you're like, it's just me and you. I was like, man, what are we going to talk about? But uh, apparently, we're just going to talk about everything. <laughs> everything under the damn sun. <laughs> From Walking Dead to mass shootings to Dude. hunting in Alaska to hunting in Idaho to shot show <laughs> to to uh, <laughs> clothes to, <coo> <laughs> to <Yeah>. clothes. <laughs> Yeah. What are you drinking right there while we're doing the show? Uh, that's water, man. I'm hydrating. Uh, so we can talk about water. You know, I've got some <laughs> jerky here. We can talk about that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but, Very good. Uh, so, uh, Nick, again, thank you so much for being on the show, sharing your, your hunting with the Leadhead Nation. And uh, by the way, you since you've been gone... Um, we we got a new logo for our Leadheads, the subscribers. Oh, what does it look like? Uh, I'm going to show it to you. So if you were going to vote, I don't know if you saw uh, the competition that we we're having or not. I think you might have been in Alaska while we were running it. But uh, so we had <laughs> we had listeners submitted uh, logos. So they got to design their own logo. They sent us the concepts. We had an artist draw them up. And let me pull them up for you here. There were three Is it on finalists. The website? Yeah. I'm on the website right yeah, now. Yeah. If you go Where to. And the Leadhead Brigade. Leadhead Brigade won it. That was nice. un, almost not unanimously, but they had by a landslide. Really? Uh that was the that was the winner. We had thousands of people vote. Um and the first runner up was the the bullet head there. Talking lead, the lead head bullet. I'm calling that mm-hmm. one. And then the certified lead head. Those two were neck and neck. They had a the, about the same. The the lead head bullet got like one percent more than the certified. I like the brigade too. I'm glad that one won. Yeah, so Leadhead Brigade. That's going to be our final uh, logo. Well, it's not going to be the final, but that's the one that our artist is going to go, and then he's going to clean that up and make it uh, a lot cooler. And he's going to throw talking lead in there somewhere on that too. And we're going to have shirts and patches. Hopefully, they're going to be ready by Shot Show. Oh, good luck on the patches. Patches are hard to get done fast. Yeah. But I got got my boy James at 1776 United working on those, so uh, hopefully. Good. And then eventually, we're going to make these other ones too because they were so awesome. So we're going to have cool. shirts uh, out of these other logos as well. But the the Leadhead Brigade, that's the new official logo to represent our uh, our subscribers and listeners. Nice. I like it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right, man. So um, Beastmaster Hunting, make sure you guys check out uh, Nick's new episodes. And um, we should have a link in our show notes. Uh, I think you'll have the, uh, you said you'll have the Alaskan ones posted by then. Probably, by yeah. By the time this show gets out. Um, it's just BeastmasterHunting.com, <laughs> right? Uh, BeastmasterHunting.com is being built right now. It does, if you go there, it just says coming soon. Uh, so YouTube. Beastmaster, yeah. Uh, be, yeah, on YouTube, just search Beastmaster Hunting. Uh, Nick Atkinson, you'll find the channel there. 
Um, if I don't have that episode up, maybe you can just put a link to the channel. And then, uh, let's see, Beastmaster Hunting on Facebook, Beastmaster Hunting on Instagram, which, screw Instagram, we already talked about that. Uh, <laughs> right. On Twitter is Beastmaster Hunt, and it's pretty much just a copy of Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but these are all ways you can contact us if you wanted to or if you needed to, whatever your uh, platform of choice is. Um, I'm on all of them. Yeah. So, uh, now you guys you have, have you still ever. got swag? You got shirts and hats? and I got, Yeah, I got the, shirts and the hats. Face, and, the face yes, mask thingies? I've got it all. Patches. Did you get patches? Were you here when the patches came in? Mm-mm, no. I got a shirt. It, I got a shirt. The, pa- the patches are my favorite. Remind me before shot and I'll bring you some of the other stuff. Nice. Um, and uh, the uh, the rifle, the AR-10 6.5 Creedmoor that we're doing should uh, should be ready soon. Got our 07 FFL uh, a couple months ago and just working on nailing down details on that. And then um, the bolt gun should be ready soon. So okay. if, you're, if you're considering a purchase for uh, something in an AR-10 platform that does, you know starts with Creed and ends with more... more. Then <laughs> we've, we've talked about it the last uh, probably four or five episodes at 6.5 Creedmoor. I mean, it's becoming very popular. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. And, uh, you know, we're, we're using all the best parts, basically. And we are talked about proof research. We're using their carbon fiber barrels and using Timney Calvin Elite triggers and um, billet receiver sets that have our sweet logo on them and everything like that. So uh, it's going to be cool. And then uh, the bolt gun's going to be cool, too. It's not going to be as fancy but uh, yeah. it's still going to have a proof barrel and it's going to be that, you know, the, the gun that you want to hike with in the mountains because it's not going to weigh very much. Now, where where can they go and get their, their rifles? So they're, uh, they'll be on the website eventually, but okay. uh, if you just want to contact me um, through any of those platforms, then I'll give you more information about them. We can talk about them <clears throat> or you can order one and I can ship it to your FFL. Very cool. Guys, check them out. Beastmaster Hunting, uh, all the places he just told you. Website coming soon. Nick, again, thank you so much, buddy. Appreciate it. And we're looking forward to hearing about your uh, cat hunt at SHOT Show. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me again. It's always good times. And as always, Leadheads, keep your loved ones close. And your CGI muzzle flash is closer. <laughs> CGI <laughs> muzzle flash. <laughs> In your non-operating AR-15. <laughs> your fake guns on the walking dead. Unlimited ammo. That's how they can do unlimited ammo because they're not shooting any. Yeah. Walking dead bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking CGI crap. Ugh, ruining the <laughs> show. Who would ever believe an AR-15 <laughs> bolt? Ugh, ruining funny. the best show on television. Been going for seven years. Jump shark. You shark jumping bitches. If I was a producer of that show, they'd be shooting real bullets. Yeah, if you're going to jump the shark, you might as well shoot it while you're flying over. Make history. (laughs) Uh, 